All right, we're live. All right. Hey. Good morning. How you going? How are you? Yeah, very well. Oh man, I'm uh, I'm excited. Ever since you uh, you sent me this folder of photos through, I've been excited. I've been looking yeah. at them. Yeah, quite a bit. Yeah, um, it's a bit of a bit of a span of a long and illustrious career to date. So after like we chatted on the phone the other day, and after that, even like I dug through a little bit of stuff, and I knew you'd done a lot. And then you sent these through, and I was like, "Okay, he's done more, even more than I thought." And I'd already thought you'd done a lot, so it's yeah. Uh, look, it's easy to forget what you've done. I mean, when it becomes work, you're, you're just doing it. You know, do you, do you remember a day at work on the best of days? Not really. So it's not until you, exactly. you look back and dive into you know a tower of four terabyte hard drives sitting in a room to dig this stuff up that you go, "Oh yeah, I did that." It's, it brings back some good memories. It's actually, it's something I've been thinking about a lot lately that I don't, um, I don't have a good way to look back through my work easily or, or even also integrate some of my day to day into that as sort of a memory. I'd love to have, you know, kind of not a social media account that is a memory, uh, of my life, you know, photos that I really love. I don't know where to keep all of that you know lightroom catalogs get so full and and just full of work and stuff like that so that's i'm actually trying to figure it out at the moment it's funny you say that because the thing that's triggering me to to memories of stuff that i've shot is facebook you get the memories that come up every now and then and you know some stuff that even came up this morning from 10 years ago and you know on this day 10 years ago and five years ago it's just like man there's all this cool shit that's been going on that you just forget Uh you've done Interesting. Okay, so so social media has got some good points too. It's it's uh, <laughs> it gets demonized a lot, but it does. Oh, yeah. You know, it, you know, reminds us of things. I got that as well. I got something pop up today that I was like, oh yeah, ten years ago. Mm-hmm. And then it makes makes you feel old though. Well, it does, um, but then you you dive in and find your hard drive and dig through some stuff. And not only that, I find over the years your taste change in images. I, I go back and look through, yeah. for example, some hard drives from my earliest trips through to Africa where. You know, a bulk of it was shot on film and I don't really drag out the negs and, and the prints from that that shoot. But, you know, the first trip back in 2004 was, you know, I was working for Nikon at the time and that yeah. was shooting on a D2H. So, you know, looking at a four megapixel digital camera and, you, you know, you pull open the files and there's not a whole lot you can do with them. But even some of the earlier trips, you know, 2007 using 1D Mark II Ns at eight megapixel and, you know, all these photographers crying over, oh, there's not enough resolution. I'm so disappointed with that new release. You know, the Nikon Z8 has just been announced. Oh, I thought it was yeah. going to be 61. It's like, it doesn't look any different on your mobile phone. So, uh, you know, man. and I've just found with a change in taste, you, you dive through old archives of images and you start re-editing stuff and you're thinking, why did I never pick up this image before? Like, Yeah. Yeah, you, know? you discover a, a diamond that was in there hiding amongst. Because, uh, uh, but I know what it's like. You know, you come back from a trip, and you've got thousands of photos to look through, and maybe you've got something you need to deliver, whether it's for a client or for a gallery or, or something yeah. like that. So you sort of got some time pressure to get through the images, and you kind of end up just skimming over something that that maybe you didn't catch your eye at the time. But then later on, you look back and you're like, that that was a banger image. It's just hiding mm-hmm. on a hard drive. Yeah. That's easier to do. I mean, you know, between shooting travel and wildlife predominantly professionally, but, you know, before that shooting for newspapers, sport, uh, and a lot of stuff in the music industry is where I actually started as a photographer up until probably, I'd say 10 years ago, I just gave up on shooting music for the sheer fact that there's no money left in it. Yeah. But, you know, a couple of things obviously will bounce in and out of different stuff through the career as we go, but it really is the sort of thing that I find just plugging in an old archive drive and just dive in and have a look around and you'd be surprised the amount of stuff that pops up that you've never considered as a great image. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, okay. So you mentioned music, you mentioned, uh, first trip to Africa. What did, what did you say was 2004? Yeah. Yeah. So how did the first trip to Africa come about? So for years, even since I was a young kid, I've been, obsessed with wildlife documentaries, but particularly African wildlife documentaries. And even a lot of childhood memories, you know, something was on telly with, you know, back then it would have been, you know, David Attenborough, still still my hero. The one guy if I could swap a life with would be that guy. But, <laughs> um, you know, even as a young kid remembering if there was something on telly, mum or dad would be, oh, you know, some wildlife shows are on telly. And 
I would be sitting glued to them, you know. And funny enough, as a kid, I was terrified of sharks. I couldn't even watch them on TV. And, um, you know, I'd literally be sitting there with a blanket over my head if a shark came on telly, and now I'm fascinated by the things. I don't know if that phobia has uh, completely disappeared. I couldn't say I'd be comfortable in the water with one. But, um, you know, there'd been opportunities to do a photographic trip that I was running with Canon a few years back, um, which was with Rodney Fox and his boat shooting great white sharks and whatnot. And yep. due to some circumstances um, in the family, I couldn't go last minute and sent some other colleagues instead. But, you know, I still can't say if the phobia is broken because I didn't get the opportunity. But look, going back to the question, 2004, <laughs> you know, growing up being obsessed with wildlife docos, I got to the point where I'd finished high school in, you know, 97 and started working. So at that time, out of school, I was working for Kodak and, yep. um, you know, developed in their print labs and, and whatnot back there. How, and how did you get? How did you get that job? Just out of school. Funnily enough, during school and studying. So after I'd left high school, you know, I had a job at cash converters for a while, selling mm-hmm. cameras and guitars. And obviously, when the good stuff came in, I'd say, "I'll meet you up five o'clock in the alley around the corner, and I'll give you a hundred bucks <laughs> for it." But uh, <laughs> that's where a lot of my early camera gear came from. But um, there was a point where. Funnily enough, I was fired at Cash Converters for whatever reason. I, I can't even recall what it was. It was, you know, I just wasn't interested anymore. Yeah. And um, I left and went, well, oh, okay, well, you know, I've lost my job at the ripe age of, well, I was probably 18 or 19. Yeah. And I thought, well, before I go home, I'm just going to go to the food court, get some lunch and wandered past one of the Kodak Express stores. And I just wandered in to see if there was any jobs going. And she said, oh, you know, not much. And you know, come in and give you maybe one day a week or so and see how you go. And within two weeks, I got a job uh, full time there. Uh, actually became Kodak Australia's retail arm. They had, had these Kodak Express stores. Uh, they were called Click yep. Camera okay. Stores. Yep. Yep. And, um, you know, was the first employee to go down as a full time sales, uh, camera sales person and whatnot there. And, that's where it started for me at Kodak. So I jumped from there okay. into their head office for a little while based up in Sydney um, yep. and ended up working in inventory management, which was as boring as all hell, just spreadsheets <laughs> and ordering picture frames and photo albums. But that was yeah. my entry into working at Kodak. But, um, you know, at that time, saved up the money. All my friends were buying cars. I didn't get my license till I was 35. I didn't need a car. I, you know, what? right through, yeah, right through my career. I mean, working in Sydney, you know, up until I moved to Melbourne about, what, eight, nearly nine years ago, mm-hmm. I, I didn't need a car. You know, I worked out of some yeah. studios up in Sydney and Alexandria and, you know, I was renting a place in Marrickville, so I just rode my bike every day. But, um, you know, all my friends back then, early out of school, were throwing all their money at cars and all that type of stuff. Yeah. I was in a band, you know, touring around, so I spent a lot of my money on amps and guitars and touring around the yeah. country and you know, playing death metal, but... Uh, oh, it, man, I, do, I don't want to derail the podcast, but we'll, we'll talk about that a bit later. Um, yeah, no, no, I, I sure. did the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> but not, not death metal, but no. yeah, pretty heavy and lots of guitars, yeah. lots of amps, yeah. lots of money. <laughs> Definitely. So, you know, what I was what I was leading to is that the money I was saving was to go overseas. So I ended up in Africa in 2004 to Uganda, Tanzania and Kenya. So my first couple of days, it was in Uganda, so up trekking the mountain gorillas. And oh, funnily enough, we actually got attacked by a whole nest, well, sorry, a whole wasp nest. So we are following the silver back for a little bit. And there was all this vine that had overgrown and we we're up to our knees sort of tangled in this stuff, you know, shooting film most of the time. And yeah. it's the sort of thing where for anyone that's ever done the gorilla trekking, you, you get an hour with them once you've found them, right? So... We found them, they were on the move quite a bit that day. So they weren't really stopping. So we're constantly picking up cameras and I was lugging a 302.8 and a whole bunch of stuff. And so so how much, like how much gear, like a full pack worth of gear, like, or or just a couple of bodies hanging off the shoulders or. I just had, you know, a small low pro backpack and just a, like a shoulder bag that would fit maybe an SLR and two small lenses. Yep. And with that, the trekkers and whatnot, you can pay porters and they, they'll carry all your, your bags. I mean, right. we were walking for the better part of probably three or four hours uphill yep. to find them. But yeah, as, we, as we're following them through the jungle, all of a sudden the silverbacks started bashing on the sides of these vines that we're walking through. 
and a big nest of uh, wasps broke open. So we had for probably 15 minutes, didn't matter which direction you went, you were covered in the things and, you know, hundreds of stings oh. everywhere. And, um, you know, a four hour walk back and it felt like you'd been set on fire and, you know, vinegar rubbed into every wound. It was itching, stinging, aching all at once. So we just went back to the, the lodge afterwards after four hours and just went straight to the bar. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet. I bet. And then oh, wow. yeah, we went and saw a, uh, a village just outside of the park the next morning. We went to, a, I literally went and saw a witch doctor. He gave me a big ball of green goop. I can't tell you what was in it. He couldn't tell me what was in it. I didn't speak the language. But one of the translators basically said, just rub it on your, on the, the bites and you'll be fine. And they were right as rain. There were others that were on the trip at the same time that were a bit nervous about, oh, I don't know, I might get an allergic reaction to it or whatever. And, you know, there's come up into big pussy welts for a couple of days and itching and, yeah, mine were, mine were right. Worked. So, yeah, yeah, yeah right. the medicine man had the goods. Knows his stuff. Mm. Oh, very cool. Uh, quickly, before we before we continue with the story, I just thought anyone that's watching live, uh, feel free to jump in the chat. There's already some chats coming through. Elena says, cool picture, uh, obviously, yes. in the background. So, <laughs> yeah, that looks very nice. That's uh, my favorite one. That's the the one for me to beat. Honestly, I I'll keep trying, but I don't think I will. Yeah, it's pretty. Like it's beautiful. What? A, yeah, I've I've seen it closer up on the screen um, that you've sent through to me. Actual. Uh, we can come back to this story. I'll pull it up now, just since we're um since we're talking about it. For sure. Um, and yeah, it's just to get. To get that with that overcast lighting, we you know it's not all blown out and it's, how, yeah. <laughs> how did you come across this? So this one was taken in Botswana in a place called Mashatu. So Mashatu was in the area called Tuli. So literally the the river that separates Botswana and South Africa. So from Johannesburg's probably about a five hour drive north. So once you get up over into Mashatu, it's a private reserve and concession. So you can't just turn up there. You have to be staying at their lodge. Mm -hmm. And it's a location that I take a lot of clients to each year. So last year, I'm back here again in November this year. Now, friends of mine, um, Andre and Shem, own a company in South Africa called C4 Photo Safaris. And they've got a side product that they have built here in Mashatu called Photo Mashatu. And it's a series of underground hides that they've installed and they've got some custom made vehicles with support gimbals built in specifically for photographers. So this place here, we've actually buried a 20 foot shipping container in the ground. So I'm as close to those elephants as I would be probably to my laptop screen right now. So wow. It's the only way you could get it. And, and this is a location that probably gets about five mils of rain a year. So Every other photo we'd seen, this had only been installed and open to the public for probably eight or nine months mm -hmm. at the time. And every other photo we've seen has been a blue sky and high contrast. Yes. So yep. deep shadows, blown highlights, a lot of editing, and you'd get yep. that almost HDR look to things. Yeah. And, you know, we got in there, it was a cold morning, which, you know, with wildlife, nothing likes to drink in the cold. So even birds weren't turning up. We're like, oh, okay, this is... Uh, going to be a long wait and particularly if it's windy no planes game so your gazelles and things giraffe this is quite open to walk to the water for, for wildlife there's not a lot of cover so for predators i mean they can hide and, and ambush there so you find on windy days nothing will really turn up because there's an advantage to a predator to be upwind yeah so you know prey can't smell them and then they also use the fact that they can't hear as well when it's windy so now, we're in there for the better part of two hours waiting for something to turn up and we were just getting, you know, guinea fowl and finches and stuff that wasn't overly interesting. Then we come to the point where I'm almost falling asleep. There's, you know, a little bench inside and I'm starting to, to nod off and then you just saw elephants turn up just out of nowhere. Silent, you couldn't even hear the things coming. And then, yeah, it was just probably 20 minutes nonstop, better part of 60 elephants in that, uh, in that herd. They hung around, they got in, wow. splashed water around. I mean, it was just, I, I just remember putting the cameras down and my hands were shaking like this just yeah. from adrenaline. Yeah. And everything's amplified because you're standing in a 20-foot shipping container up to your chest underground. So yep. every sound, even you could hear them breathing through their trunks and that was echoing in through the container. So yeah. it was everything amplified, just incredible. 
Wow. Mm. How many uh, were you just were you just taking photos like crazy, just trying to get to get the shot, like just just almost panic mode, just you know, um, yeah. How long do you you know it might not last for very long? Got to keep keep shooting, keep shooting, kind of thing. Yeah, um, well, you just don't know. I mean, that was the first experience I'd had in the hides. So, you know, I've been back in here year on year since, and I think this one was 2013. Okay, and you've got a lot more control when you know what to expect but yeah. even you know going in there after you've done you know hours of time in this hide it's still like the first time from an experience point of view but from a photographic point of view you start trying to produce some different pictures and even at this point i mean at that that stage i was using three cameras so i had a 16 to 35 on a 5d mark 3 which is this image this, at yeah. 16 yes yeah, so i shot at 16 mil then a second body had a 500 f4, and the third body, I believe, would have been either a 100 to 400 or a 70 to 200 to 8. Yep. And just picking off shots and just going long, medium, wide. And it's one of my mantras when I shoot for myself, but also when I teach my clients, taking them away on photographic tours, is just shoot everything long, medium, wide. If you're picking up a lens and you start repeating the same pictures, change your lens and keep shooting until you run out of ideas, change your lens again, and you'll start to see different opportunities you know there's a fellow called yeah. mike mike dexter a south african photographer that took a phenomenal shot from this location and it's a close-up of one of the trunks as it's come up out of the water with a water droplet mm, yep. but through the water droplet you can see the rest of the herd oh wow you know? okay and yeah i i haven't seen anyone else nab that shot again since but yeah it's the type of thing that when you look at these images, I haven't seen another one similar since, just due to conditions. It's very rare that you get overcast skies. So yeah. the other thing too is this was originally one 20-foot ship container. So the watering hole was a little bit smaller. Now it's two 20-foot shipping containers butted together. So they pulled it out of the ground probably five or six years ago and extended yep. it. So the watering hole is bigger. So to fit that whole watering yeah. hole in one shot at 60, you can't do it anymore. Yep. So you you basically can't get that shot anymore at all. So um, it's pretty special to me for that reason. But it actually got entered into BBC World Wildlife Photo of the Year that that oh, same okay. year because no one had really seen the shots yet. It, there are a dime a dozen now from the, that location. I think I wouldn't enter an image from this location because the judges have probably seen a lot of entries from the Mashatu High. But in the same year I entered that, I got through to the final judging round in the mammals category. And there was another South African photographer, uh, Greg Dutoy, who entered an image from the hide, completely different looking image. It was shot at night with a slow sync flash and a really blue white balance. Yeah. And completely different looking image. We're almost in each other's footprints. But <laughs> he, he won the category and then that year won BBC World Wildlife Photographer of the Year from, from that location. From the same spot. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. But an entirely different looking shot. Yeah. 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 Oh. And it just goes to show, you know, people's tastes are different. Judges are going to look at images differently. And yeah. it was just something they hadn't seen before as much as this has probably not been seen before at that time. Yeah. You know, remote cameras and setting cameras up like that, you probably get something similar, but you've just got no control of the camera once it's remote. It's different now using apps. You can control everything. You can get yeah. robotic pan heads and, and <laughs> yeah. everything else of the sort. So it's not too hard to get it. But, yeah, Greg's shot was, was an absolute perler as well. As well. Yeah, mm. what a coincidence. The same year, I guess, when there's something new like that, it attracts, um, yeah, the, the veteran photographers that, that are sort of looking for a new special location. So you guys yeah, got, definitely. Got, got first crack at it. Yeah, um, without a doubt. Yeah, in the chat though, was uh, Jay Shani's asking whether, or was asking whether it was remote triggered um, and, when, and whether it was going to get stepped on. But yeah, that's um, yeah, I, di I didn't realize that they'd built hides, uh, you know, semi underground hides and things like that. That's yeah, um, yeah, I had no idea. I thought everything and, in, in Africa was um, out of a jeep or or yeah, long lenses, you know. Yeah, and there's other ways around it. I mean, to to answer the question that had just flashed up, I was physically underground basically 20 foot shipping container that's been buried um no windows no mesh literally 30 centimeters between my fingertips and lens and the baby's feet right there so wow. you know i get i get asked if it affects the the animals at all and it doesn't i mean that baby's breastfeeding off its mum 
with us being, you know, we're not talking loudly or anything, but even if you are talking, they're so used to your presence there. And particularly in this location in Mashatu in the Thule in Botswana, the elephants are extremely relaxed. They haven't had a huge amount of issues with poaching and whatnot up there. And you'll see a very different behaviour in elephants in different parks throughout all of Africa. But particularly if you go to areas where there's a lot of tourism, because this is a private concession, you have to be staying at that lodge and driving with those uh, rangers and guides that work there. So you can't just turn up publicly and drive your own car around. Yeah. So for that reason, they've always had distance and respect and, and whatnot in the way it's managed. Whereas if you look at elephants in, say, the Kruger National Park, where it's tarmac roads and 50 vehicles driving and pushing and beeping their horns for people to get out of the way so they get a view, mm -hmm. you'll find elephants there that... Once you've annoyed one, you'll know about it. They'll be charging at you and chances are they're not going to stop. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, just quickly, how, how, like how many people would be staying there at a time? Like what sort of capacity does a place like this have for guests? So at this time, Mashatu only had three different camps. Oh, sorry, two different camps. So there's... Tented camp and main camp, which have been around since probably, I mean, my first trip to Mashatu was in 2007 and they'd been open since probably early 2000s. So they had tented camp, which is basically a, a timber deck with a canvas tent, um, an outdoor shower and bathroom, fairly basic, but you're in the bush with no fences, no nothing. You, it, you're very, very wild experience. Whereas main camp, you've got larger concrete wall chalets, air conditioning, a bit more comfort. But yeah. I think during COVID, they had a new lodge called Euphorbia Lodge in Mashatu, which has only opened last year, but due to COVID. And that is their high end, top end uh, lodge. So between them, there's only eight rooms at tented camp. So at any one time, if they were at full capacity, you'd have 16 guests. Mm -hmm. whereas main camp from memory have about 16 rooms okay. and then your yep. phobia lodge is very very high end so i think they've only got maybe 10 10 chalets but these things have got their own plunge pools on the deck per per chalet oh. and they are phenomenal so the price range obviously differs but the yep. beauty is if it's just a place to lay your head at night and eat some food i'd Personally, up until, you know, I haven't been to Euphorbia Lodge yet. We are taking guests there in November this year. But okay. I've preferred tented camp personally. I just like it's humble. It's basic. When you get out on a game drive, you're in the same vehicles, in the same land with the same access. But right. it's, it's, it's literally just your accommodation that changes. Your experience yeah. in terms of, of what you're going to see and do isn't yeah. changing. No, so there's there's no priority in different areas of land where people at Main Lodge can only go, for example. Yeah. So, yeah, there's no limitations in that respect. But the way it is managed is you'll have all of the vehicles from all three camps. I mean, the concession is massive. You can drive for hours and you're still within their concession. Yeah. And for that reason, you've got different territories for lions, you've got different territories for leopard, and it's probably one of the best locations in 18 years of traveling to Africa for leopards particularly. Very relaxed, wow. uh, particularly female leopards generally are going to be more relaxed because they hold uh, smaller territories, whereas male leopards will cross over larger territories. So if they're in a territory where another leopard might be, they don't want to be seen and they want to move on really quickly. Yeah. Whereas you find the females here, they'll walk by your car and sit on a termite mound making eye contact with you from two metres away without a care oh. in the world. Wow. But, um, yeah, so how sightings are managed, you're going to have, you know, 10 or 12 vehicles on that property at any given time. They're all in radio contact. So if you come across something that's going to be of interest, it gets radioed in. All the other cars then, whoever finds the, the sighting, manages the sighting so if they're first on scene okay. then they'll only have three vehicles at a sighting and then they get rotated in and rotated out so sometimes being the first to find something isn't always an advantage yes you sort of get first dibs before mm -hmm. other vehicles turn up but if they're hunting and then you get rotated out for another vehicle so they can come and see and then you miss the action yeah so yeah, okay that can tend to happen, but I, I find that's more an issue in properties that have way more rooms 
you know, you can get yeah. to lodges that have, you know, 30 rooms and you've got so many vehicles out and so many different customers that have to be taken into account to get a view. Yep. Whereas at Mashatu, especially when we're with photo groups, our vehicles, we book privately. So there's no other guests outside of our group in the cars. So our priorities are all linked. We're not there with another guest that's like, oh, can we move on board? Yeah, so the yeah. priority for us is photography and the photographic groups when we're on site take priority on the best light, the best sightings, the best time. Whereas your general tourist, they'll get rotated out for us um, when when it's photographically rich. So we do have an advantage yes. in that respect. Yeah. 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 Because, yeah, they're not too worried about it being good light. They just want to see, no. they just want to see animals and yeah. Pretty much. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. And um, that is really the big difference between going on, say, a photographic tour versus going on your own accord as a tourist. Yeah. And I know for me, the first two trips that I did to Africa on my own, you end up in a car with a complete stranger that you don't know. And on your first day, everything with two eyes and a heartbeat, you want to stop and you want to see it. And even if the light's not great, you're just excited. Yeah. So what tends to happen is you might go, say, three nights in one lodge, then you go to the next lodge for four nights, and then by the time you're three or four days in, you're not going to stop for a zebra or an impala. You're going to move on and find something a bit more exciting. But yeah. if you move to the next lodge, say day four, you move to a new lodge and you get put in a vehicle with people that's their first day in Africa, they want to uh, stop for everything. And that is the major difference where we all start as a group in the one vehicle. You've got a whole row of seating to yourself. You've got plenty of room to move around and you don't have to, the driver and the, and the guide aren't there trying to make everyone happy. If we move on, we move on. If we want to stay, we stay and we make the we make the call on what we're up to. Yeah. Yeah. So everyone's goals are, are much closer aligned. Obviously people are going to have different feelings. Even photographers on the same trip might some might want to stay, some might want to go, but it's got to be a lot tighter consensus than if you're there with just a completely random group of people. And then like you yeah. say, even worse, you know, it's it's your second week. Um Tra traveling around Africa and it's their first day. Yeah. Very, di very different levels of, of what you're trying to find and excitement levels and things. Yeah, definitely. And there's reliable, like uh, going back to different territories with leopard and other things, especially if something's denning. So if you look at hyenas or wild dogs, if they're denning, we've got the ability that if I've got say 12 customers, three vehicles that will rotate people through in different days and we don't, change what guests are in which car because if uh, I'll, I'll rotate through cars so i'll generally have myself in one vehicle one of my business partners in the in another vehicle and then the guys from c4 that i operate with in south africa one of their guides in the third vehicle so the guides will rotate but the guests will stay in the car with the guests that they, were, they started with and yeah. that way you know this morning this car saw this thing then the afternoon anyone that didn't go and see it from a different vehicle can. Whereas yes. if a, a customer was to change vehicles, it's like, oh, well, I didn't see it this morning. Can I go back? Well, we all saw it. We don't want to go back. So exactly. Yeah. And that's and the way I the, personally manage. Yeah. By, by chance, you know, one person might end up on missing all of these great experiences because they kept getting rotated into a car that, yeah, that, yeah wanted to do yeah. something different. Yeah. Very and interesting. And FOMO, can change the dynamics of a group yeah. pretty quickly. It, it only takes somebody. And look, the, the Hyatt is a prime example where you get this shot here. You can fit a whole bunch of people in there if you wanted to, particularly now that it's two 20-foot ship containers. So I generally wouldn't put any more than eight customers in there at a time. Yeah. So if I have 12 customers, then two vehicles go to the Hyatt in the morning, one vehicle's on game drive. Then the next day, those people will go in in the morning. The mornings are generally better than the afternoons. Yeah. And, you know, get, they're not guaranteed to show up. During the dry season, they will because it's pretty much the last reliable section of water. Whereas as soon as there's been some rain or there's still pockets of water in the riverbeds, the elephants will just drink there and there's no reason for them really to, to come here. And okay. it's been strategically placed because it is a migration path where they'll go between food and water. So it's, it was very reliable location to actually install a hide to begin with, knowing that we call them elephant highways. You'll just see these tracks. and they, They'll use those same paths for 20, 30 years, the migration oh, wow. paths. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, in that regard, you can get a 
really amazing sighting. And then the people that were on the game drive, you all get back for brunch and everyone's like, oh, did you get the elephants? And this particular one, this I'll go back to this story just to, to elaborate a bit more on it. We had probably the first, this was on the third morning of staying at this lodge on you know, day three, essentially. That was my first day in the hide. So I had, you know, the guys that I work with took guests in the first morning uh, and then the second morning. And then I was allocated to take my car in on the third morning. So the first two mornings, no elephants turned up. So everyone would get back to the lodge for brunch and then, oh, did you get them? Did, you know, did the elephants turn up? Everyone's all buzzing with excitement. And yep. you could read it on their face that they didn't see elephants. Oh, so, uh... you know, we were in there that morning. And we got mud splashed all over us. Like I was literally up to my up to my face and everywhere covered in mud. So we all said, you know, let's get in the car. Let's just put, put your jackets on. We'll get back mm -hmm. to the lodge. Just just try and act like you're, you're a bit bummed out. And they said, did you get elephants? And then one by one, we all just took our jackets off. We had mud sprayed all over us. They're gone. You've got them. You got them. So luckily we were there for five nights. So all the guests, pretty much every morning from day three, we got similar sighting so everyone ah, got pictures awesome. yeah yeah that's great it, it would yeah. be, and obviously you can't you can't guarantee this stuff like they're they're wild animals but mm. you know it would be sad if you were sort of there for for that and you were the the unlucky group that it didn't happen for yeah. but um i assume the way that you design these trips you know they may not experience that exact thing but no doubt across their trip they're going to experience something special somewhere along the lines that maybe someone Absolutely. else has experienced so so yeah, yeah but hopefully there's enough opportunities that you're going to come home with something special oh it always happens you know you've got three cars out at once and we do split up for the fact that you've got you know three cars out looking and, and finding this stuff yeah. and you know you can have a morning where you've had amazing sightings in the hide and then the game drive vehicles that were on game drive instead of the hide that morning, they got a leopard kill. They got, you know, something that yeah. everyone, you know, everyone in the hide can feel a bit bummed out. But once you get that out of your system and yeah. you realize that, you know, you're in no control of it, we're in no control of it, yeah. then, you know, it's unlikely that you're going to get that same sighting again. You know, even me, I've had sightings where I've been lucky enough to witness some stuff that I've never seen again. And there was some pictures on last year's trip uh, at the end of last year that we had some bat ear fox kits which are their babies mm -hmm. that had been washed out of there was basically a culvert over one of the roads between the property where there'd been no rain at all for a year and there was wow. heavy rain this morning and the parents had put the, the kits inside of this culvert under the under the road and mm -hmm. they got washed out so these things were literally they would be smaller than the palm of my hand they were tiny really and five of them shivering in a little ball on the ground and the parents were freaking out just trying to find somewhere to put them in cover yeah. and generally you're never going to see them that small bat eared foxes even to see the adults is pretty hard and rare they're quite skittish yeah. and these things i've probably got some pictures as we go through later we can talk a bit more about it but um yeah that i know i'm not going to see bat eared fox kits that young ever again it's pretty yeah. pretty hard yeah Yep, and it's just you, you just happened to be there. Yeah. Yep. Right place, right time, and I just think for me, you know, while you can feel a bit defeated and deflated when you see someone else that got some shots that you didn't get, but yeah. I get that out of my system. I have no expectations going in. Whatever happens, happens. You know, for me, my my priority is ensuring that the customers get the shots yeah. anyway. So, you know, I've been lucky enough to do it for eighteen years straight, but. You know, there's never a year where I go over going, ah, oh, another year in Africa. Oh. It's not worked to me. Yeah. <laughs> seen it all before. You know? Yep. No. Yep. No. The day you've seen it all, then, yeah, some, something will pop up to remind you that you haven't. Yeah. Yeah. Well, go going back to that first year, that first trip, so you, you saved up and you planned a trip and you went over there by yourself? Yep. Uh, yep. And it was purely for your own your own joy, your own photographic trip. Was it to build a portfolio or was it purely just, I just want to see and take photos of animals? It was just that. I had dreamt about it and I just want to go and see it. So, yeah. you know, I was basically going to travel agents. I had for probably three, four years before I decided I'm going to do it. I, you know, just, and I'd still kept them year on year, every single brochure and catalog from flight center on Africa and just addicted yeah. to looking through this. Right. So Essentially, if you plan a trip to Africa, much like my first experience, this 
pretty much rings true for most people. It's deciding where to go. And a lot of the time people will be of the opinion, oh, well, it's going to be once off. I'll probably never get a chance to go back. So I just want to try and see and do it all. Yeah. And that can be a mistake because I can guarantee you, you'll be trying to plan when you're going back while you're sitting at the airport before you've <laughs> left the country. It's, it's that addictive. Yeah. And I, you're basically faced with the option between East Africa, which is Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda, mostly, and mm-hmm. South Africa. So Botswana, South Africa, and Namibia would be your, your top choices, right? So yeah. to try and do South and East in one trip, A, you're going to be made of money. B, yep. you need a hell of a lot of time. So mm. it's a choice between one or the other. So I know for me, if you see most documentaries and the stuff that really influenced me early on, and even today, you see most documentaries on Animal Planet and whatnot, it's generally based around the migration. So Tanzania in the Serengeti or the Masamara in Kenya. Mm-hmm. So that was an option for me. And then I figured if I'm going all that way, I may as well do the gorilla trek while I'm there. So it was essentially yeah. a five-day itinerary just for gorillas. It's pretty much a day and a half, almost two days to get from Kampala up to Bwindi, where the, the gorillas are in Uganda. You can also see them in Rwanda and, and other countries, but I chose them on the Botswana side. Um, for a reason back then was a lot of political unrest and whatnot that would happen around Rwanda at the time. Mm-hmm. Uganda is generally a safer bet. While it's not, you know, not guaranteed, it was generally a safer bet. And getting in, getting out, you're pretty much there for one night, do the gorilla trek, then turn around and drive all the way back again. Yeah. And then from there, flying into Kenya, to Nairobi. And it was all, it was basically pitch your own tent, help cook and clean. It was like one of those participation overland trips. So, you know, on there were 30 other people in a giant big four-wheel drive bus that you could slide open the windows. Like everyone would have a window seat. And then if you stood on the seats, there was a pop top, like a canvas roll top. So you could stand up Uh. at the top of the bus. But you're so high off the ground that you're shooting down on everything. There was really no option to get amazing shots. But yeah. You know, at the same token, I think that was probably about a three or four thousand dollar all in trip versus, yeah. you know, the way I'm doing them now is we, we're chartering our own private aircraft and flying customers in and, you know, doing it yeah. on the luxury way. It'd be hard to go back to doing the overland stuff again, but, you know, every, everyone's got a budget. So, you know, mm. yes, Africa's expensive, but it doesn't have to be. But all I can say is for the money, the experience is chalk and cheese difference. And it comes yeah. back to what I was talking about earlier between national parks where people, you have to stick to the road and you've got every other member of the public driving in there versus yep. private concessions like Mashatu here, where mm-hmm. if you're staying there, you're being driven by guides and trackers and the work that those guides and trackers do, they know these animals' behaviours, they sit and follow footprints and they literally find these things for you. Yeah. Whereas you could save money, jump in a car and self-drive and have no idea what you're looking at or where to find them or what to do. Yep. And that's really the big, big difference of where you can travel and what you would do. Yeah. Interesting. And that's that's separate to the fact that, that what you do actually, you, you're with a photographer as well. So there's, there's the option of sort of self-guided versus uh, heading somewhere where you're going to get, I guess, taken care of and there's a smaller amount of people. And yep. then the next step again is is specifically booking onto a photography tour as opposed to just going to it you could go to a private um reserve a, a private lodge um not on yeah. a photography tour and that's yeah yeah so you'd find even if you don't need the advice you can be a confident photographer with your gear you know you've done wildlife photography before signing up on a photographic tour it's not about i'm a beginner and i need to learn something even if you're advanced yeah. there are advantages to it for the reason that, again, if you were to travel on your own accord to the same lodge, paying the same money, you're mm. going to be put into a vehicle with a complete stranger unless you book that vehicle privately. So if it's just you, you're paying for all the other empty seats in the car. So you'd be paying upward of nearly 1500 US per day to book the vehicle privately. And that's yeah. what I do. So I book three vehicles privately for our group for the two-week trip in three different camps. Right. So right. by the time you split that over four people in each car, it's significantly cheaper than going yourself and booking that car privately on your own. Look, if you can yeah. afford it, by all means, then you don't have to worry about the needs of anyone but yourself. But yeah. that's going to be a bloody expensive trip. 
Yeah, and then and then yeah. like you say, like I mean, even someone, I mean, even if you're a skilled photographer, um, even an expert photographer, I'm assuming if this is your first trip to Africa, you may you may not be necessarily an expert wildlife photographer. Maybe yep. you are. Um, so there is that element as well. I mean, you've been doing it for 18 years. I'm assuming it doesn't matter how good I am with the camera. There's probably something you'll be able to help me with. Um, yeah, definitely. There. You know, like it's not, it's not just a matter of um, can you operate a camera uh, when you're photographing wildlife. So yep, yeah. a lot of it is preempting situations and animal behaviour. You know, you can know you can basically be a, a walking instruction manual for the camera that you use, but mm. until you've been in that position, you've seen that behaviour, and you know what to expect. It's the type of thing that you could be on a siding looking one way, taking one picture and everyone else in the car, everyone's going to come back with completely different pictures pointed at the same thing. Yeah. So it's being able to at least point out, all right, guys, you've got some shots, particularly if you find very first light versus very last light. And it's the case of, you know, getting to really late afternoon, the sun's just gone below the horizon. You're pushing 10,000 ISO trying to get, you know, wild dogs are a prime example as they'll take off and start hunting at last light in the afternoons. Yep. And they move quickly. I mean, you're driving at 60 to 80 Ks an hour, full speed, bumping around. You're not going to get still shots. Yep. So, you know, you hit the brakes for a second while these things are running after a herd, like a small herd of Impala. So I'll recommend shoot slow motion pans. Just drop your shutter speeds to a 15th of a second or a fifth of a second and get yep. something dramatic and different Otherwise, you're going to end up with, you know, two, three hundred pictures of bursts of wild dogs running at two and a half thousandth of a second at twelve thousand eight hundred ISO. That when you get yeah. back, you're going to delete because they look like rubbish. So yeah. it's just knowing if the light's not on your side, you can still create a great picture. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And and the only way you know that is you've been there and done it before. Um, you know, it, it, when it is your first time, you're probably so caught up in the moment. You're just trying to get something and you're not yeah. thinking, you're not thinking about the options that are there photographically. You're no, exactly. excited. Um, a couple of good questions coming in, in the chat, uh, from Jay Shani, would the best starting point be to identify the animals that you're after and then research sort of the specific trip location and guides from there? How, how do you go about that side of it? Look, I mean, if you had a priority for a particular species, then there are locations that are better known or are a lot more reliable on finding that species. So as an example, like Mashatu itself for elephant and leopards, it's second to none. Like it is one of the best locations for me in 18 years to get shots like that of Ellie's, but also to have leopards that are quite easy to find. And a lot of it can come down to the topography of the location as well. So Mashatu is semi-arid, so it's a lot of shale and rock. It's not too dissimilar to, say, the Pilbara. So you'll see a lot of sort of rolling gentle hills, no big hills and cliffs, a lot of winding riverbeds that for most of the year are completely dry, and then some big trees along the riverbeds, and that's perfect habitat for leopard. They need ambush locations, they need trees, but it's fairly open, so you don't get long thorny bush where it's A, makes it very hard to locate wildlife, because you're mm. shooting through grasses and long grasses. So everything's yeah. really short, you know, and a lot of succulents and whatnot. So it's all yeah. low ground cover. So in a way for photography, really dusty when in dry season. So you get this stunning light and backlit glows from all yeah. the dust kicking up. Whereas, you know, the classic open grass plains, if you look at the Serengeti, you mm. can literally stand in the middle of the Serengeti in some spots and turn around 360 degrees and see nothing but horizon. Yes. So there's nothing blocking light. There's, you know, no shadows being cast anywhere. And you get that early morning light behind you straight into the eye of cats walking head on into your lens. You know, mm -hmm. if they're the type of shots you want to go for. Whereas you'll find some locations, you know, rhino aren't easy to find at the best of times, being that they are under heavy attack from poaching. And mm -hmm. one of those animals, which sadly I can probably predict that in my lifetime will go extinct mm. for that reason you can't find them in some locations. So they're extinct in a lot of locations. So, you know, wild dogs, again, hard to find. But, you know, if there was one area in South Africa that's really well known for predators, if you wanted to see leopards, lions, cheetahs, wild dogs, and, you know, all the scary stuff with teeth, mm -hmm. then 
a place called the Sabi Sands in South Africa, S-A-B-I. Sabi Sands is probably renowned as one of the predator capitals of South Africa. And then again, naturally, the Serengeti in Tanzania or the Masamara in uh, in Kenya. But for me, my favourite, I mean, Mashatu definitely is up there for one of the favourite locations to me. But if I could choose one country, if I could only go back to Africa to one country, it would be Botswana. And really? Why is that? It's quality over quantity when it comes to places to choose from. So it's very low traffic tourism, but high end. So they don't have a lot of budget options through Botswana, but there's a location in particular where I'm headed back to this year in November called the Okavango Delta, which the only way in and out of these lodges is light aircraft. It's surrounded by water and you've got all these little dotted islands of land around that have lodges built on them with their own airstrips. So we've got our own aircraft chartered. It's like a taxi service. You'll stay at this lodge for three nights. They'll pick you up, fly to the next one. Then between the second lodge and the third lodge, we've chartered helicopters. So we'll get doors off for an hour to shoot on the way to the next lodge. So we do it in a way that the transfer itself becomes an experience also. But you're only looking at about a 30-minute flight between some of these camps. But the only way in and out, again, is is by light aircraft. So you see nobody out there. It's as wild and remote as you'd probably get in Africa. Is, is are we talking very very expensive for a trip like that? Yep. Is that yeah? Yep. It's right up there in terms of price point. Yeah, okay. and it's a type of place that my the first trip I did in two thousand and seven to the Okavango Delta, the average would have been for a pretty decent lodge, like a lodge that would be about fifteen hundred US per person per night today, would have been about three to four hundred US per person per night back then. Okay. So you can imagine the price point for some of the lodges now. I mean, there are places in there that are about two and a half to 4,000 US per person per night. Wow. Okay, mm. next level. Yeah. Next yeah. level. So you'd probably find the average would probably be about 1,000 US a night at most US of the lodges night. there. Yeah. yeah. And, and how much time would you need in a place like that to, um, to really enjoy the experience and, and see enough uh, yeah. of it I, obviously you're not you're probably going to want to go back every time like you say but what would be a good length of trip length of stay look the, the delta i say go to at least two different lodges within the delta if mm-hmm. time permits and i wouldn't stay at any location less than three nights yeah and why i say that is day one you have to get there so you miss the morning game drive so if you get in and depending on availability of flights and other things you might get in around lunchtime Mm-hmm. then you get the afternoon game drive then day two you get the morning and afternoon game drive day three could be your final morning you get the morning game drive you come back you have brunch then you leave yep so i generally find if you go in for one night you're only getting the game drive in the afternoon of the day of arrival and then the next morning so you're only getting two game drives for the one night stay so i'll generally say three nights minimum anywhere but four nights for me enables you to really unpack and relax yeah. whereas there's nothing worse than doing two nights because you just get there and then you're packing your bags and going somewhere else and that is quite often going back to the point i made earlier about people go this is probably going to be my only trip and they try and fit everything in yeah. and you spend of a two-week trip you're probably spending five days in transit yes. and then you're getting half days at most of these locations so you know, and you'll have days where you had a quiet game drive that morning. If that was the only day, then your experience of a place that's really well known for just having nonstop action, not every game drive is going to turn out that way. You could go yeah. four or five days without seeing a leopard or a lion. And, you know, one of the first questions I ask when I turn up to the lodge is I'll go straight to the head rangers um, or the, the guides, a lot of them who I know personally from years of working with them, and I'll say, you know, what are the updates with the resident lion prides? When did they last kill? Because if they've just had a kill within a day, they're going to be flat out of sleep for two days digesting. They're not going to do anything. Yeah. So that helps you prioritise. So if I'm here for three or four nights, I'll go, okay, well, the lions haven't eaten. Let's prioritise that this morning or this afternoon. Yeah. Because there's a high chance we'll get them hunting because they have to eat. Whereas some of the resident leopards, if they're denning and have got cubs, then it's reliable to find them in that location. So there's no real desperation if there's something that would take a high priority over. Mm-hmm. For me, if if wild dogs are in the area, go. Because they, they have massive territories. 
and they'll be in the concession for whatever time it takes them to cross it and they're out and they may not come back through for another couple of days or weeks. Right. So it really depends. And it's the type of thing everyone's excited to see something, but if it's going to be easy and common to get, then it just helps to draw on that experience to give the confidence to my clients that just let's prioritize this signing, especially if someone's come across something, it's like, come and get this now because there's a chance that you won't get it again. And again, yeah. drawing on that level of experience to ensure that you're getting that for your clients is is my job while I'm there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, especially if maybe the yeah the the feeling in the early days of the the trip is oh no we want to we want to find a line or we want to do this to have you saying look no no let's focus on this this won't happen again like let's go yeah um, yeah yeah because yeah. yeah, otherwise. Uh, without that knowledge and experience there, you could you could sort of trick yourself into, yeah. um, I don't know, the FOMO side of things and yeah, yep. prioritizing maybe something that, that you could go and do tomorrow. Yep. Not only that, it's, it's bringing them back to earth as well because a lot of the time they'll be floating with their heads in the cloud because they've, they've got a sighting of a line for the first time. Yeah. And I haven't even picked up my camera. And they'd be like filling memory cards and, oh man, you must've seen a lot of lines. You haven't taken a picture yet. And I'm like, yeah, but I don't need a picture of the back of a lion's head. Yeah. So if you stop, and this is usually day one, first sightings. And then you'll say, we've got the ability to move this car wherever we like. And quite often on any sighting, it's, for me, it's about the quality of the sighting, but it's the quality of your foregrounds, backgrounds and what the light's up to which for any photography, it lights priority one. So yes. quite often you'll drive into a sighting and everyone's got blinkers on. They're just looking straight ahead. There's the line. I'll be looking behind us and everywhere else to say, position the car here because I'd rather that background than what we've got yeah. right now. So whereas everyone's just yelling, stop, 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 stop the car. And everyone starts shooting frantically. And I'll yeah. be like, okay, get this out of your system because look at the shot you can get from there. And then what I generally do then is once we're back and we download images in between game drives, there's, there's not a whole lot to do. Some lodges, you know, you go for a swim and the first couple of days, everyone's just soaking up the knowledge. They're bringing out their laptops and doing editing. After about the third day of getting up at 4.30 a.m., you get back after brunch, everyone goes for a sleep for two hours. So yeah. in that time, I generally find, you know, day one after that first game drive, it's just looking at everyone's images and just identifying if there's some problems. Are the shutter speeds too low? Is there yeah. some AF problems? Is there a custom function that's been set in the camera that's causing them some issues? It's identifying that, but it's also going through just to point out, okay, you're doing a lot of this, but not a lot of that. Have you considered using this lens instead? Exactly. So it, it really gets everybody on the right playing field in day one. Then my job becomes a lot easier from day two onwards if you knock all that out first, because mm. you know I've always told customers, I can't fix what I don't know about. So if you're sitting in the car thinking, oh, I've had enough of this, like, why are we doing this again? Say it. Come to me after a game drive. Pull me aside if you don't want to talk about it in front of everybody else. But in general, I'd, it's the golden rule is if you have a question, the worst thing you can do is hold on to it. Yeah, exactly. And you only get out of a trip or or, or a teacher or anything what you put into the experience. So if you're yeah, yeah. If you're just kind of just sitting back and just letting things happen when you've really got questions or you're not sure about something or your gear's not working, yeah, you got to get yeah. Gotta, yeah, you got to get involved and and ask questions and get help. But it's just being tuned into that as well. I mean, mm. you know, th there are a lot of people that have jumped into this industry for the wrong reason. There are a lot of people that you know, they run photographic tours, so their customers are paying their way to have an experience for themselves. And, mm. you know, reputations last and run out very quickly based on how you behave on those type of trips anyway. But that's what I do. I've always made it a, a point at day one. This is why I'm here. I can't fix what I don't know about. And you know, as much as I can share the knowledge on what I do, people learn and sh everyone shoots differently. So, now you will find even I will pick up new things and new experiences on trips and it's just sharing that, passing that knowledge on. And, you know, I was talking to somebody even just the other day that was talking about how different the approach is, particularly in the professional industry. Mm. I mean, my background has been working in the professional photographic industry with Canon, you know, working with Canon Australia for 14 years, um, working with Nikon for five years, both of which was managing NPS, so Nik Nikon Professional Services and Canon Professional Services. So, over those years, not only in wildlife photography, I've been working with the best of the best professional photographers and 
you know, giving that advice and hearing how these people do it. Yes. And it's a lot of that. It's I've found there's a lot of techniques that I draw on outside of wildlife photography that can come into play. And really, if you're not obsessed with light, you're just taking record images. You're not creating the best picture that there is. And again, exactly. it's just moving. And I see this a lot, even if you just look at, say, street photography. Mm. A lot of people just get used to seeing a subject of interest to photograph and they forget that they have feet. You know, they try and fix everything by zooming in rather than moving. And, you know, I've always said a small movement will make a bigger difference. Yeah. And, you know, nothing could be truer, particularly with wildlife as well. Not only is it foreground, background and light, but it's just moving. Just I'd rather have 50 different images out of a 20 minute sighting than to be sitting in the same spot with the same lens with a card full of shots that look identical. Yeah, once once you've mm. got it, you've got it. Unless you're waiting for that that perfect moment of yeah. a wildlife experience that's about to happen, that's different. Yeah. Um, but yeah, once you've got the shot, change it up, um, yeah. change your lens, or change your situation in relation to lighting and things yeah. like that. Um, and it's knowing. A... Sorry, I was just going to add one more point to that. It's yeah. knowing when to move because, again, you get lines after the really good first morning light. As soon as it starts getting warm enough they're just going to be flat out asleep in the shade. They're not going to get up until the afternoon. So having that pressure of turning up, oh, let's just wait, something might happen. There's a point where it won't and you know it yeah. won't and being able just to move on. Yeah. Yeah. Make the call. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that yeah. just comes with experience. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I do have a question on on what we were just talking about with regards to gear and, and moving around before we do. Um, just shout out to Jethro in the chat. Thanks, Jethro from over at the Seven Podcast. Appreciate it. Um, you talked about moving around and not just not just zooming in and out um, from the same spot. I, uh, I used to shoot Nikon uh, DSLRs and sort of evolved into, I oh, shot Canon before that anyway, long story. When I was shooting Nikon, ended up shooting a lot of prime lenses. Um, that was when I was doing a lot of wedding photography, uh, but that then spilled out into everything else I did, sports. I was shooting primes for, for most things. I was often shooting 28 millimeter, 20 millimeter, and then on the longer end, I'd, I'd shoot a lot at, at 105, um, at a 105, 1.4 that I loved. Obviously not wildlife stuff because none of that's long enough, but um, for sports and things, they were actually really fun lenses to shoot with. And then when I switched to Canon uh, to the RF system, um, I pretty much went all zooms. I thought it would simplify my kit, you know, pretty much three lenses, off I go. I got, I got a, a, a really good coverage, um, great quality lenses, lightweight. But I feel like maybe I've lost a little bit of that. Um, I used to move around a lot more. I used to search for compositions and light a lot more. When I just had the 28 millimeter on, I'd always be be moving around. And now I feel like I, I just zoom in and out a bit more. Do you shoot... Other than your long telephotos, do you shoot mostly zooms from the flexibility? How do you how do you retain that um, mindset of searching for compositions if you're using zooms all the time? Yeah, so I've always said zoom lenses make photographers lazy, and yeah. <laughs> while that's true, if you're aware of it, then it can be the opposite. It actually gives you more options. So. Correct. You know, it can be the Achilles heel having the wrong lens on when something happens. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'd hate to have, a, say, a mid, mid range lens on, say, my R3, which is what I favor for my longest lens. So I do use the RF 600 F4. Mm -hmm. um, so there's only two prime lenses that I reach for on any of my trips when it's wildlife based, and that's my 600 mil and mm -hmm. the 100mm macro. Okay. But, 100 mil macro, I'm only using it as a macro lens. So there's not a point where I'm throwing that on for 100 mil for anything else because I'll just use my 24 to 105 for that range. Mm -hmm. So look, out of a vehicle is different to on foot. So on foot, mm. you don't really have the option in Africa. There are some locations like uh, Mana Pools in Zimbabwe is one place where you can get out on foot. But for a better part, you're shooting from a vehicle. So different countries, different rules. So most Southern African locations will have no roof on the cars. It's yep. just think of a Toyota Land Cruiser with the roof cut off. Whereas you'll yep. find in Kenya and Tanzania predominantly will have Land Rovers with roofs and then the pop tops you'd stand up out the top or they're modified cabins. They got really big windows that open that you can shoot out the side. Okay. But 
between that and lens is I'll generally travel with minimum of two cameras for more than one reason. You know, reason one, you want to have a medium range and a long lens on at all times. So if you're not close enough, you've got one option. If you're too close, you've got another. But I'll generally work with three camera bodies personally. So I'll have a 16 to 35 or the, the 15 to 35 on my R5. Yep. Then with the R3s, I'd have the 100 to 400 and then my 600. So at any given time, you can fill the gaps in your focal range. And particularly mm. where you get animals that will come right up to the car, having a 15 to 35, and I use the Canon Connect app and just put a bean bag on the ground. So again, walking elephants in Mashatu. So going back to those elephant paths I was talking about earlier, if you know they're coming in that direction, they're going to walk along that same path. So you get ahead of them. I jump out of the car, throw the camera on a bean bag, connect it to the app, and then just sit in the car at distance with a 15 mil lens as they walk through. And I've actually got some footage of me taking those shots where this female is just walking along. They're about, I'd say 35 odd elephants. The first ones walked past, didn't even stop, didn't even look at the camera. And this mm -hmm. camera would have been probably two meters from their feet. Oh, wow. And next minute, this one female stops. And you can see her looking straight down the lens with interest, taking a couple of steps towards it. And you can hear the other guests in the car going, oh, my God, you know, they're going to crush your <laughs> camera. And you can hear, I'm just like, oh, hopefully not. But, yeah, A, it was, it was raining. The camera's out in the ground in complete open on a migration path with elephants walking through it. But the shot was worth it. I got it. And the yeah. camera's on the gates. So, oh, you know, primes... They're a bit limiting for wildlife. I mean, a 600 mil is yeah. great, particularly, you know, birds, you've never got a long enough lens when it comes to birds. Yeah. But, you know, having having those options and, you know, if you are using a prime and you need to get closer, depth of field and compression comes into what lens to use and why. Because you could get close enough at 400 mil and, yeah, you could get tighter with 600, but you're also going to have a lot shallower depth of field to play with. So if you're trying to decide which lens to reach for, you need to consider depth of field as well. Because if I had, say, a herd of elephants at close to infinity distance away, then I don't have to worry so much because I know my depth of field is going to be covered because it's at infinity. Yep. Whereas if it's at a closer focusing distance, you need to stop down a lot more to get them all in focus. Mm. So the wider your lens is, the closer you are, the more depth of field you're going to have. Yep. So a lot of the time if you're setting up shots, it really depends because if you want to compress and drop the background, then go at distance, use a longer lens. Whereas if you've got the luxury of getting closer and throwing something on that's a little bit wider, it's a bit more forgiving for depth of field as well. So it really does yeah. come down to what are you trying to achieve out of your shot. And again, having those options in private reserves means you can drive off-road. Yes. And that's yes. why I, I will only go into private concessions for that reason because if you can't get off-road, you're only going to get as close as the road permits yeah that's right and then obviously yeah. yeah the more the more gear you've got the more reach the more options the better that experience is going to be uh, because you're limited by basically being on a on a train track to go through the yeah yeah um okay so gear wise you probably take uh, you know a lot with you as well um more options than what you just talked about what do you recommend uh someone that's coming on one of these trips for the first time what do you tell them they should take as a minimum requirement uh, assuming they're um you know they've got a reasonable kit um what what would you sort of let them know hey you, you got to have this otherwise you're yeah. going to have a fairly terrible experience over here so i'd say look again there were the two reasons you'd take two bodies and the first was you know two lenses two options without changing lenses because it gets dusty and you just don't want to do it but second to that, if you take one camera body and that fails or it gets dropped and smashed, your trip's mm -hmm. finished as far as yeah. photography is concerned. So, look, I'd say at a minimum 100 to 400 would be at minimum what you'd want to take. Like a 7200 yep. just would not reach enough. When you say 100 to 400, are you using the EF uh, 100 to 400 or are you on the yeah. RF 100 to 500 yet? I'm still using the EF 100 to 400. I find it as fast for focus. I mm -hmm. find it as sharp and at 400 mil on both lenses, you're working with a wider aperture on the EF than you are on the RF version. I, I thought that was the case. Yeah, it stops down quicker, um, doesn't it, than the EF. Yeah. And then obviously you've got the benefit of being able to go all the way out to 500. But yeah, at 400, it's, what's it at, like uh, 
5.6. Yeah, already. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so look, the 100 to 400, the EF at 400 mils, 5.6, whereas you find the RF 100 to 500, it's probably about 6.3. You know, it's a mm. third of a stop. It's it's not a whole lot, but a third of a stop in shutter speeds and a third of a stop in ISO, it's not the end of the world. No. But having th that much more loss between its widest aperture and its longest means you, you're losing a bit more light. Yeah, uh, maybe for me, you know, for someone who's not, a primary you know not a wildlife photographer maybe for me and a 100 to 500 would be better because i'm not going to have a 600 mil lens you know sitting next to me yeah. whereas for you you've got that option that that's what you're going to go for if you need extra yeah. length so yeah that probably makes makes a lot of sense um, yeah i mean the, the other way you look at it too and i'll get asked that same question a lot i mean particularly when i was working for canon it was the first thing someone would ask and even then, I would give my honest opinion, regardless of the fact that, I mean, you know, I'm not going to trash talk any products or any brand anyway, but yeah. I've just found a common thing that a lot of people would do before the RF lenses were a thing would be to throw a 1.4 converter on top of the 100 to 400, mm -hmm. which means then you're getting to 640 at f8 yep. when you've got it on. So if you look at the fact that you're getting to 500 without a converter at 7.1 out of the 100 to 500 RF, Mm. I find you've got just a little bit more flexibility in the EF 100 to 400. And if you need more reach, throw a converter on and you've got 640 F8. Yeah. So that's where I decided it wasn't worth the investment in the 100 to 500 when that range for me, 100 to 400 sits between my 600 mil. Yeah. And I'll quite often throw one four converter on top of my 600 if I yep. need really big lengths. So particularly with birds, but again, you can have locations even though you can drive off road, you might have a sighting. There's just no way you're going to cover that distance before the sighting moves off mm -hmm. or there's a river in between you and that subject, or there's rocks or a cliff or something that you can't get around. Then having that extra reach comes into play. But I'd say that the only RF lens that I wasn't hell bent on needing would be the 100 to 500. I've certainly found the 100 to 400 EF2 not mm. the original. So the original series one, what that I used to call the dust, the, the dust yeah, pump. The, the, the pump action one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The dust pump. That thing was <laughs> not only, not only slow, I just found it horrifically soft. It was never a sharp lens. Yeah. 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 It didn't get great reviews. No. Yeah. So much so that, you know, even the whole time I worked at Canon, I'd, I'd never used it because I knew it wasn't a great lens. Yeah. And I'd honestly say for probably the first year and a half to two years of the Series 2 coming out, I still didn't touch it. I was using a 70 to 200, and back then I had a 500 F4. Yep. Because if I needed extra length, I'd throw a converter onto the 7200 and would find that focused faster and gave sharper results than the original 100 to 400 EF did. Yeah, And again, for nearly two years, I just ignored the 100 to 400 series two. And then mm. I took that on a trip to Africa and it was like, man, this thing's insanely sharp. Mm. So of course, the first thing I did when the 100 to 500 came out was I just wanted to see if it was worth the upgrade. And yep. in my personal experience, I don't think it is. Yeah. Is it the but, only ad adapted lens you're still using? Is that the only EF, EF no. lens you're using with the system? Okay. So I've still got, you know, some of the really fancy prime stuff. So the 24 oh, 1.4, okay. the 35 1.4, um, you know, everything else like 16 to 35 is replaced with the RF 15 to 35. My yep. 24 to 105, I'm using the RF version now. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the 7200, I still haven't up upgraded, which oh, really? I would like to. You know, there's jobs mm. commercially at home here in Melbourne you know, I don't do a lot of wildlife photography around Australia. Yeah, I do Kakadu and I'm headed back there in June with some customers. But mm -hmm. for a better part, outside of those locations, there's, there's not a lot of wildlife photography in Australia for me that holds my interest. So the 7200 doesn't get a lot of use, but shooting you know, corporate, corporate work and commercial jobs and music, then the 7200 does its thing. And look, just a couple of weeks ago, I was shooting the Smashing Pumpkins show. And just reminded me of how heavy that lens is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you yeah. carry it around for a little while, you start um, yeah, you start wishing for that RF version that yeah. weighs yeah a kilo or whatever it does. It's so light. Not only yeah. that is it's the packability of the lens because the yeah. seventy two under the EF series two, you've got to put it in your backpack laying down. So if the size yes. of your backpack, it's taking up that much room. Yep. Whereas you can't put it in standing up. Whereas the new one you can. So. It's a game changer. Yeah, yeah. That alone for me is why I would upgrade. 
Yeah. Yeah. Or um, leaving it mounted on a body, you know, it fits in the same spot that, that it would with any of your other smaller lenses mounted yeah. to it. Whereas, yeah, I used to have to have a spot with, that would fit my body with the 7200 mounted and, it, you know, yeah. it would take up a heap of room in a camera bag. Yeah. Definitely. And look, I use with camera bags, I'm using the Shimoda bags and I deliberately use the DV inserts rather than the DSLR inserts. So the Shimoda bags, much like, you know, similar to F-stop bags, the backpack inserts pull out. So yep. it's a wireframe professional hiking outdoor backpack when you pull the camera insert out. Right. So you get sort of two uses out of the bag. But I found the actual inserts themselves, the DSLR ones, are just that little bit shallower, whereas the DV ones, I can fit the lenses standing up rather than uh, laying down. So right. handy hint and for anyone. And does that just make the backpack kind of a little bit more expanded with with the bigger um, insert in it? Yeah. 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 You know, it's not much. It doesn't add extra pressure on the zipper or anything, but mm -hmm. where the laptop sleeve is, it's on the back panel of the door. So if you do have gear standing up, the shorter ones, you'll have the, the end caps of your lenses sticking out. So when you close yep. the bag, there's nothing stopping the laptop from putting pressure on your gear. Whereas yep. the DV insert reaches the lip of where the laptop sleeve is. So it gives you a bit more protection. Mm, so I find it helps with that as well. Yeah. 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 Right. Is that, um, do you use those bags on a trip? Like an, uh, if you were going to Africa, do you use those bags um, as your sort of your main camera bag? Yep. So yep. I, working out of the car, I don't use camera bags at all. The camera bag yep. is literally getting my gear on and off aircraft. And mm -hmm. that's pretty much the extent of where I use the camera bags. So in vehicles, the last thing, I mean, you can have a seat next to you where you, you can pop your camera bag down and zip it up and your lenses are all safe in there. Yep. But the way I personally work in the cars is I'll sit next to the driver in the passenger seat, which leaves the, the elevated rows for the customers behind that if they've got questions, you know, I'll just turn in my seat and answer them. Whereas yep. the front seat, you've got the dash in the road. Then you've got uh, the yeah. aerial, you've got the driver next to you as well. So it's not the optimal seat. So I'll take that and leave the optimal seats for the customers. So mm -hmm. in that regards, because I'm just in a, in a front seat of a car, I don't have anywhere to put a camera bag. So I actually use a camera vest. So I look uh, like the, right. the tragic tourist sitting there with a shooter's mm. vest on. But batteries <laughs> and I don't change lenses really because I've got the 600, 100 to 400, 24 to 105. The only time I'll change a lens out on a game drive is if I've got a big herd of elephants or if I've got wild dogs coming right up to the side of the car or hyenas right up to the side of the car, then I'll mm. throw the 15 to 35 on the, the R5. Yeah. And I'll actually screw the monopod into it, drop it over the side of the car to the ground. Um, and then I'll connect yeah. that to my Canon Connect app on the phone. So you can just move the camera around on the monopod, looking at your camera screen on your phone. Yeah taking the pictures and getting a composition, moving a focus point, having complete control. And I've got, there was a shot a few years ago that I did before you had Bluetooth connectivity and apps with, it was probably a 5D Mark III from memory mm -hmm. where I had some wild dogs come right up to the car. And what I used to do is I used to get a cold shoe adapter and put that on the top of my uh, hot shoe mount in the camera. But yep. then I'd get a tennis ball and cut a little cross into it and force that over the top of the, sh of the hot shoe adapter. So then you had a tennis ball sitting on the top of your camera. So when you put it upside down with a monopod, you could rest it on the ground without dirt and all sorts of, and literally crap sometimes going all over your camera. And it anchors it, it anchors it to the ground. So you've got a point of contact. So your hand and the ground stabilizes it. Yep. And then I had a really long cable release and I'd sit there and just hope that it was focusing. And so many times it would be focused on the background and not the subject. And it was just, hitting yeah. so what I'd do is, you know, 16 mil, I'd just stop down to F8 or F11 yep. and I'd, pr I'd pre-focus. So I just hold the camera up, pre-focus and drop it down. And that gave me more luck. Yeah. But now it's all connected through apps. It's all touchscreen on your phone. You literally touch the subject. You can change all of your settings and yeah, you come back with some absolute corkers. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But uh, that is literally the only time I'd change lenses. So the camera vest, if you need to, you've got the 15 to 35 in there because your camera bodies have, have got yep. them. And again, at Mashatu, you've got the, the photo vehicles as well. So they're like a game fishing chair in the back for the customers. And next to them, they've got a big padded trap case. So you just open the lid. You've got your water bottle and everything in there. It's all padded and dust sealed. Really? And, yep. And then in front of you, you've got a 
gimbal, like a Wembley gimbal head. So you can just chuck your long lens on it and have complete support. There was probably photos of it somewhere in, in the pickies that I sent through of the photo oh, vehicles, but yeah. I'll, I'll see if I can find it. We should, um, I'll bring up, actually, maybe I will bring up some pictures while we're talking about gear just for fun. For um, sure. Just to, but the, the, the original, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, uh, it's crazy. So that's um, the, uh, Oh, hang on. That's a picture from the past. So that was for anyone that doesn't know me from from my background. I I worked for Canon Australia for 14 years, and for probably eight years of that, um, up until 2020, when this team, it was called Canon Collective, were all made redundant due to COVID. Um, we used to run photographic experiences all around the country. So, you know, at that time, there was about 50 different photographic workshops a week happening all around Australia for about eight years. <laughs> I still can't believe that when you said that the other day, I, after we had a, a phone chat, and you mentioned 50 a week, I, even after the call, I was like doing the numbers in my head. I'm like, how does that even work? <laughs> no one could it, touch us. Like we had it's, it's competitors in the market you know, we're probably dropping, you know, $2 million a year just on wages for the team. So, you know, I'd never hold it against Canon for stopping it, but Canon Australia were the only company in the world that had Canon Collective. But look, our doomsday plan, so you see Greg there on the left and Scott on the right, the two guys at the ends, and now my business partners with the Photography Workshop Co. So we had a a doomsday plan that if all went to hell in a handbasket, that we'd continue doing what we did under our own banner. And that's exactly what happened. And, you know, yeah, it's rewarding doing your own thing. Like any freelance work, it's unpredictable. It's, it's stressful not knowing when things are happening. And you know, we kicked this off in 2020 when we couldn't travel, we couldn't do a thing. So yeah, that was hard. <laughs> that's um, what a time to, to, uh, to start a, yeah. a business for photo experiences. But I mean, you made it happen. Uh, it's like, I don't know. Sometimes you just you need to be forced into that moment to jump and and go for it. Um, well, I wouldn't have left under my own steam. Like, in all honesty, you had that was literally probably a tenth of the gear that we had nationally in our team. Was it really? Yeah. When your job was going and doing photo workshops and doing amazing stuff, and you had every single Canon product times ten on on the shelf that you'd pick up at any given time. There's no way I would have left if if it was up to me. So, yeah. you know, it, it was hard being made redundant. It was hard leaving security and the money and, and everything else. And if anything, you know, your identity got stripped off as well. I mean, I'd been Jay from Canon for 14 years. I'd had people that relied on me when I was at CPS. You were dealing with photographers that I was known for what I did because I worked for Canon. So while that was hard to stomach and hard to take and, you know, it was a bit of a, a punch in the guts, but I've... I found, you know, it's been rough for two years during COVID, but we're coming out the other end now. And between Greg, Scott, and myself, we're we're much happier people in general. So, well, that's good, good to hear. Yeah. Mm. So, a tough time, but um, worked out for the best in the long yeah. run. But yeah, yeah. but I, c- I can imagine, you know, being being involved just at that level in the industry, like you say, meeting all the photographers that you you were able to meet you know, that sort of experience with gear and, and from both sides of, of Canon Collective, which so Canon Collective was more of a um, an experience more so uh, with the everyday photographer or people like me, even even professionals, but from the point of view of like maybe learning something new or meeting people or whatever, whereas your time at, at CPS was specifically about supporting um, professional Price. photographers. Pros. Yeah. Um, and and helping them do what they need to do, whether it's um, facilitating gear repairs, gear loans, on-site stuff at, at events. Yep. Is you were involved in all of that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I managed CPS for about eight years with Canon Australia. So yep. with that, it was being on site at Formula One, the Australian Open, MotoGP. Yep. So all of the major press covered events in the country, you'd be on site with backup gear and on site repair. Mm-hmm. And that's, it's not just Canon Australia. That's a global thing. There's CPS that exists in every country, um, all yeah. through Europe, US, Asia. Um, Nikon do the same thing. So before working at Canon, I used to do the same job for Nikon. So, you know, getting to see that, that was dealing with all of the press photographers, all the major newspapers, you know, Olympics, Commonwealth Games, World Cups, all of it is is covered. So every year when the, the Olympics comes around, there's always, if you look at... Um, DP review and all of the 
the online sites. Every mm. year they're waiting to see the gear cupboard from Canon. And you've yeah. got like 60, 600 F4s and 200 R3s lined up on a shelf. Yeah. That's that's what we used to do, yeah. So, t- so tell me this, because obviously, you know, Nikon versus Canon, there's so many things. It's the the age old feud, even though you know Sony's there, but no one no one cares. Um, Nikon versus Canon. If you were at the Olympics and MPS was going to have a wrestling match with CPS, who would win? Who's the Look, who's the winning team? Knowing the performance of the R three, I think it's hard to beat. I mean, the AF systems in the R three. People are generally saying that between Canon and Sony are leading the race as far as autofocus systems are concerned and that mm-hmm. Nikon still has just been edged out by it. And yep. look, while I haven't extensively used the Z9, I have got a very good customer based over in Perth um, that was on a trip with me last year in Kakadu that I had the Z9. That was the first time I'd physically seen and used one. And mm-hmm. look, coming from a background, I used Nikon for the first 10 years and worked for them, obviously, for for that time. But back then, when I was working for them, Canon ruled the world. Sony weren't even on the scene. They didn't exist in in the SLR land. I mean, they never existed in the SLR land anyway. They were mirrorless from day one. But when it came to performance, I mean, Nikon were just so far behind Canon. And then they leapfrogged when the D3 came out. Yep. And that was at the time when Canon had the 1D Mark III that had the horrendous autofocus issues. Yeah, And this would have been probably 2011 or 2012 from memory. And what had happened, I was actually part of it when I was working for CPS at the time. And we had maybe 20 loan units and we had no problems with them. And we're seeing all these people in Europe and the US complaining about all these autofocus issues. Hmm. And Canon lost a bunch of market share over it. Everyone jumped over to the D3s with with Nikon saying that the yep. autofocus was reliable and it was better in low light. Yes. But... Um, what it ended up being is the little stoppers underneath the mirror, they were expanding in heat. So when the when the Mark III, the 1D Mark III came out in Australia, it wasn't during our summer. So I just wasn't seeing it. I had 20 uh-huh. loan units, everyone from Reuters, Getty, AP, News Limited, all of them were using them. No one in Australia was having issues. Wow. So roll around january or yeah late january 2011 or 12 we're all day one open yep australian (laughs) open and next minute you know you're sitting there with nearly 50 degrees off the court of heat and day one every photographer's coming in i mean i remember you know cameron spencer all the big names in australian sports photography going all my shots are out of focus what's going on some of them are back front back focus, summer front focus. There's no consistency to it. Yeah. And, you know, we had the guy that designs the autofocus systems from Japan and the head of professional business global for Canon Inc. on a plane from Tokyo office there. I had literally my boss at the time, who was um, Alan Brightman, ring me saying, look, I can't get down to Melbourne for at least two days. I'm away on on other business. Can you make sure you look after them? So they roll in. In the clothes that they had on, no other luggage. So, you know, we had to look after and get a change of underwear, a toothbrush and everything to make sure they were comfortable when they got there. And (laughs) they literally came in to try and diagnose what the hell was going on because you had the world's media all using the camera saying, what what the hell? So it ended up being the stoppers underneath the mirror that were expanding in the heat. So what would happen is the sub mirror would be sitting at a different angle depending on the temperature. Wow. So the AF starting point was in front or behind the focal plane. That, that was the cause of it. So the issue. You know, when it came down to it, you know, who would win the battle now at the Olympics? There's no mirror box. There's no, none of those problems. No. So between the two, I think at the end of the day, the camera doesn't make the photographer. So I'd say mm. depends who's driving. Wow. Very, very uh, diplomatic answer. There. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and look, but, you know, yeah, I've... I've still got good friends on both sides of the fence in the company. And, you know, I'd, I'd definitely say that the R3 is still edging out as, as the better camera right now. Mm. I don't think there's anything on the market that even touches it. Yeah, it's it's an amazing camera. And, I mean, look, I haven't uh, – the issue is – and you probably get to see it because you, you go on workshops with people that have great kits so you get to play around with the Z9. I haven't had my hands on that before and I haven't had um, a, a good play with an A1. Um, but, yeah, certainly the R3 – I don't know. I can't imagine anything with better autofocus, but no. 
Yeah. And I loaned a bunch of Sony gear last year, actually. So I was working, I ended up doing a workshop with Sony and loaned their gear for a couple of months. And I used the A1 um, and I tried their 100 to 400, their 70 to 200, I believe the, the 24 to 70, 28, the 16 to 35. Yeah. And I just found that the A1 was kind of, you know, neck and neck with the R5. I didn't see it was any better. So hmm. to sell everything and start again and reinvest and, I didn't see the point. And the big yeah. thing for me was having run CPS, I know what support looks like. Yeah. I know if something goes wrong, I've got a camera today that keeps me working. There is no professional services with Sony. So that that for me was one of the biggest linchpins and one of the bigger reasons why I stayed with Canon. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, when you've got that much insight into what... Um, what support is available for professionals, especially with longer glass and stuff like that. Um, yeah, it would be hard to to make the choice to jump ship when they don't have that sort of setup yeah. in Australia particularly. Do, do they have that kind of setup uh, in other countries? Is it just Australia hasn't or, or they're just not, it's not something they're focused on? It's, it's, yeah, professional services. I mean, Canon and Nikon have been doing it for so long. I mean, since the 90s. So yeah, that's a massive investment. So, you know, CPS at the time when I was there would have had probably five, 600 mils, probably 15, 400, two eights. I mean, you're talking good amount of gear that mm. it's going to be unlikely that in any given week that a pro photographer is all going to drop a 400 mil lens at the same time. Yeah. But there was, a, there was enough there that when major events were on, there was still gear left in Sydney as backup gear for people like all the other CPS members around the country that aren't sports photographers and aren't shooting that event. Whereas you'll find, you know, with Sony, without having professional services and having that level of gear, you know, if they've got one 600 mil and that happens to be out in service replacement loan, what am I going to do? I've just dropped 20 grand on it, which I did. I dropped 20 grand on the 600 F4 and I had the choice of, do I stay with Nikon? Sorry, do I stay with Canon? Do I go for Sony? And mm. to me, it was a no brainer at the end of the day. I know if my R3 has a problem, they've got a shelf full of them. Mm. So, you know, there's a dedicated team that do that and it doesn't exist with Sony yet. Yeah. I think it's something that they'd be stupid not to do it to that level, but until they've got enough users, like AP, Associated Press, have now a global agreement. They all use Sony. Yes. You know, if you, if you uh, looked at the, at the top, you know, there was Reuters, Getty, AP being the top mm -hmm. three. You know, Getty are still pretty much 100% Canon mostly. There are some photographers in Australia um, that work for Getty that do use Nikon, but it's it's maybe one or two out of the full time team in Australia. Then you might get a handful in the US, but their contract is is with Canon. Um, you know, Associated Press have that same, and they've got service agreements and everything else in place with Sony as well. But the, the other thing to touch on as well is that with Canon, you've got employed service technicians that are trained to global standards as Canon. Whereas you'll find a third-party service agent, you know, they will get probably support and training by Sony technicians. Yes. But where Canon Australia anyway, if we're just going to talk local, they're the same technicians that have worked with Canon for 20, 30 years. Yeah. They know yeah. it inside out. Yep. Big time. Yep. And they've so, been trained. Yeah. Yeah. I can... Uh, you know, just I just thought this, this probably illustrates your, <laughs> your love of Canon quite well. Well, that was funnily enough. That was that that was back in two thousand and ten. So that was about two days after the World Cup had finished in South Africa. Oh, really? And funnily enough, Cameron Spencer actually took that photo. So Cameron, if anyone's not aware of who Cameron Spencer is from Getty, his uh, you know the shot of Usain Bolt at the Olympics, the slow panning shot with him looking straight down the barrel of the lens. Yeah, that was that was Cameron. So okay. he was on this trip after the World Cup had finished, and at the time, the the pick editor or the head of Getty in Australia, Stuart Hannigan, uh, he basically asked, "Can I stay on for an extra two weeks and do a trip so I've got some images that we can put into the the archives." Because all the stories of the World Cup, they're going to need a picture of a lion and, you know, some yep. other stuff to go in the mix. So he was lucky enough to snag a, a spot on the trip with me for two weeks. Oh, that's so, pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's a um, good trip for both of you. It's, um, no, absolutely. Good memories. Those sort of things are, yeah, once in a lifetime opportunity. So this is uh, this is what you were talking about with the sort of no roof Land Cruiser yeah. um, shooting out of the back there. 
yeah, so there's, wow. you know, there's nothing stopping. Everyone's like, oh, what if a cat jumps in the car? They don't. They've got no interest in you. So you provided sure? you, you don't... Are you positive? Oh, look, it's, there's no real reported <laughs> cases of it happening. But look, it, it's more a thing that they're born and there's vehicles. They're used to seeing them. So it's not a threat and it's no interest to them. So, you know, it, it comes to a point where if you stand up and you break the silhouette of the car, then they'll pay attention to that mm, so okay. the golden rule is don't stand up don't yeah you know they can be right next to the car and you can move you can talk and they've heard it all before you know they can be asleep and you can sit and you know you wouldn't do it but you could whistle and make some stupid noise they've heard it all before they could they won't even lift their head up but if you move gravel on the ground their heads up straight away really so, I mean, if you took okay. one step out of the car they'd be on you that is um that is a little scary. I'll be honest. Um, yeah, a little scary. What What about um, What about traveling with this kind of gear? I mean, I've traveled. I've traveled to a lot of countries, but um, with my camera gear. But you know, I usually max out at at two hundred mils. Like, ha, ca, like traveling with long glass and yeah. and three bodies. How do you do it? So for me, it's you know everyone says just put your camera bag on one shoulder and pretend it's life. <laughs> it, what is it does way? nothing. Look, I think the most I think I've carried on and once was about 23 or 24 kilos. Yeah, same. But, I, I've, I've done that before and I was I was worried the entire time that they were going to ask me to weigh it because, yeah, you yeah. can try and make it look light, but once you get to about 20 kilos, it gets tricky to make it look effortless to put it in the overhead bin. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. truth is, as soon as you've got a sizable backpack, that's going to draw enough attention. And I don't exactly. use rollers for for that reason as well, is that rollers suggest heavy gear and it suggests, can I weigh that? Because you yeah. look at any flight, even domestically right now, the amount of people taking rolling luggage on because they don't want to check in because they just want to get off the plane and get in a cab and leave the airport without waiting for their luggage. Yep. So it looks like luggage, so they're going to ask to weigh it. So what I'll personally do this was for a Canon trip. So these lenses were given out to customers as well. Mm-hmm. So that's not all of my gear on that particular lineup. Yep. But yep. You know, what I would commonly travel with now, so if I look at the recent trip to Antarctica would be different to, to Africa. But if I was to pack to leave for an African trip tomorrow, I actually carry, and I've just got it here, I'll grab it. The new 600 mils come in a soft pouch now with a strap. Uh-huh. So like the old ones used to have the, the hard cases yep. and they were bulky and, you know, you couldn't carry it on your shoulder. Mm-hmm. So because it was a hard carry case, you know, yes, you're allowed to take a small personal item. So for women, like a handbag, for, for guys, a laptop bag on mm-hmm. top of, say, a 10 kilo limit for carry on. So yep. my Shimoda backpack, I'll throw all of the gear in it. I'll carry that over my shoulder as my extra personal item. And if they really wanted to argue, I can say that'll fit under the seat. That's a $20,000 lens. If you wouldn't mind, there's no way I want to check this in. As soon as you start getting rude and defensive, if they're having a shit day, they're just going to force the fact because you're an asshole. So exactly. you've just got to keep that in mind. I just stay polite. Sometimes if you turn up and too polite, they're like, okay, what's this guy hiding? <laughs> For me, the key is just turn up and be yourself. Just say good morning. You know, if the person before was a bit difficult, you can go, oh, geez. You know, you handle that pretty well and instantly you're, you're on side. But more yeah. and more now, I mean, all the flights going into South Africa now, it's self-check-in. So you're just going to the bag drop and no one's asking to weigh your bag. But look, yeah. when I get to the other end, the opposite. Johannesburg's notorious for weighing your stuff because okay. if they if they can get a bribe out of you, they will. And I've had it so many times. They're like, oh, you know, you open your passport wall and there's a $10 US note. They're like, oh, you know, I reckon you might be able to get on with, you know, that $10 US if you pay it, you pay it. But in the end of the day, I'll take the 600 in its own little pouch and then my backpack. Now, the absolute secret weapon, again, is that camera vest. Uh... So those, those pockets are deep enough to fit the R3s and a lens next to it. So I can literally, the contents of a whole bro, pro-sized backpack, two bodies, 100 to 400, 24 to 105, 15 to 35 would be my average kit and then teleconverters will all fit into this. Hmm. So if I need to, I'll just wear that because the last thing you want to do is the 
bag's already overweight. You then don't want to rip that out at the check-in counter and start filling it because they're like, well, hang on a minute, you're still carrying it on board. What's the difference? You don't want to have the argument. Mm -hmm. So I'll throw the bodies, lenses and spare batteries into it. So when they weigh the bag, it's within checked luggage allowance. Yep. Then you just get back to the lounge, pack it back in, throw it in the overhead. But where no you one, can... No one ever looks at you a bit sus when you're wearing a vest that's full of bulgy, hard things? <laughs> to be honest, it, it doesn't bulge out all that much. Like it, okay. it doesn't look... And you see, you know, a lot of tourists turning up with vests on. They're usually khaki in colour. I keep it black. Yeah. And I'll, and I'll wear a black hoodie as well, just so it blends in. It doesn't look too obvious. And I found that works for me personally, but... Look, it's the type of thing that when you get to the other end, I'd, I'd rather work out of something on my body when I'm sitting in the car than opening and closing a bag and having that at your feet and getting in the road. So I find it's just an yep. efficient way to work as well, yeah. Okay, yeah. So the key is, yeah, uh, keep everything looking light and, and ideally actually light if possible yeah. um, by by putting a few strategically placed um, bits of equipment. I mean, I do I do this similar thing just with a regular jacket. If I'm traveling somewhere, my jacket I carry on um, just in you know on my arm or whatever, um, and then it usually has some extra yeah. stuff in it. Often I often put batteries in that sort of thing because you got it. Yeah, so just, I just have a, a a bag full of all the batteries and that kind of stuff, and it's quite heavy. So I'll just throw that in the pocket of a coat. I know that worst case. You know, they're not going to get smashed if I accidentally drop my coat or something like that. So I usually, yeah, yeah be, be a bit strategic about it. And then, yeah, yeah. similar. Kind a of different strategy. country, because I've done it in so many places, but I remember 2014 when I was going through Dubai on the way to Kenya, I was already in the airport. So I'd flown Sydney to Dubai mm -hmm. and went went through all that rigmarole with the camera vest. And I'm like, cool, I'm in, I'm in the airport. I'm, like I'm stressed out of my mind until I get through check-in. Mm. because I don't want to check my camera gear, right? I can't relax until I'm through. I'm a nervous wreck. I'm sweating. I'm in a really shit mood because of that. And once you're through to the lounge, then, you know, sit down, have a drink and chill out. But where yeah. I got caught out is when I was in Dubai, I just figured, oh, well, I'm in the airport, so it's all good. But if you've never been to Dubai, when you get to the check-in gates, there's actually a big glass elevator and you go down one floor to the check-in gate. And then where the check-in yes. counter is, they've got scales, Yes, in, in, when you go into your gate, into yeah, same, your gate same, same, same as like Singapore and stuff like that. I've been caught yeah. there. The same, yeah. same, yeah. And I didn't know because you can't see it. You you get down either down the escalators or the lift, and you're like, oh crap, they're uh, weighing on their way on. So, you know, mm -hmm. you're in clear. There's nowhere to hide. So, you know, you can't just start pulling stuff out of your bag and drawing attention to yourself. So, mm. I paid excess. He said, look, I'll let you carry it on. Just, you know, put it under the seat in front of you because you do have an extra item and, you know, your bag's 15 kilos. You should only have eight or whatever it might be. So I ended up paying, yeah. uh, it was probably like $60 US or whatever it was. But oh, yeah. to, to avoid it, you get to know which airports do what. But yeah. I generally find that, that that camera vest, you know, I can have 15 kilos in that alone. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And batteries is where most of the weight is. If you look at batteries and lenses, it used to be camera bodies. I mean, I came from using the 1DX Mark IIs, which are heavy. Yeah. Whereas the R3s, they're light. They're light as now. So I'll leave the bodies yeah. in my bag and put my lenses and batteries in the in the vest. And that's mm. enough that really reduces enough weight that you don't have that problem. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, I want to talk to you about some other workshops soon but before we get off the topic of of africa i thought we'll just we'll click through a couple more photos sure um hopefully if this works i assume where where is this is this in australia that's that's actually uh darwin botanical gardens at the end of i a, thought so a trip yeah <laughs> um i thought it was it didn't yeah i was like i don't think this this doesn't look like africa but you never so know. that's the the crew i work with so nt bird specialists you'll see in that photo down in the foreground so you got luke patterson who's probably one of the most renowned bird specific guides in australia so his company that i have an exclusive partnership with for all of our photographic tours through the top end so yeah uh, kakadu back up there again in november with 12 12 customers so that one's all all around birds and wildlife yeah Jeez, you are you are all over the place um what about this that's namibia so that's traveling up to sauces fly out of vintook so that's probably 
another half a day drive before getting into Sausage Vlay, where it dead Vlay is. You know that pan surrounded by dunes with the dead petrified trees? Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, so it's on the way up, up to there, yeah. Yeah, right. Cannon Collective behind the scenes. Yeah, back in the <laughs> day. So I think back that was Cape, Cape Hillsborough up in near Mackay, I think, up there. So they got the kangaroos that come up at sunrise on the beach there. So it's a pretty it's a bit of a tourist trap. Like everyone's there with selfie sticks <laughs> and stuff these days. So, yep. yeah. Yeah. And that's in Mashata. That's this location here. But there's a big escarpment up there that you can get up. There's a spot we take the customers usually later on in the trip. And yep. um, we just go up there for sunset and drinks and canapes. But, so, yeah, look at that. Um, look at that sunset. You can just tell it's going to get like orange. Or, well, that's know, the, the dust. Sun, the sun. Yeah, it's just yeah. like the sun's still high, but you can just tell it's it's going that way already. Yeah. Well, right on the point, just behind me, you can't see. There's a massive baobab tree that sits on the edge of that cliff. Ah, uh, right. So yeah, it's a really really nice location. Yeah, looks like a dream location. So that's, you know, we don't pile them all into one car, but that was uh, that was the last Canon Collective Africa tour that I ran under the Canon banner uh, officially, but, you know, obviously doing these as my own business now. But you'll see the fellow down on the left in the black jacket holding the lens up like a Wookiee. <laughs> that's Andre. <laughs> so Andre from C4, who uh, is my exclusive um, ground handlers over there. So I do all my business through them. So he's the owner of the underground hides that gets you into position for those shots. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. So I didn't realize that. So so these this these tours um they started off as something you would run for Canon Collective or, or as part of the Canon Collective thing or so it was before that even that you started running tours before you were with Canon or is that when yeah. it began? Yeah. So before how, so how did it actually when how did the first tour start? How did you go from being the um, you know the kid going over to Africa, spend everything, all the money you've saved to go over there and take some photos by yourself to actually being yeah. a guide? How did that happen? So I was running them on my own before Canon. So I was basically every scrap of my annual leave when I was in CPS, so Canon Professional Services in Sydney. Mm -hmm. So I moved to Melbourne in 2014 yeah. to join the Canon Collective team. And the Canon Collective had been going for probably a year and a half or two years before I joined the team, but it was very, very different. It was, they used to call it town hauling and it was just putting out things on photo message boards and forums that Canon's coming to this community hall and we've got a presentation. It was death by PowerPoint. It wasn't experiences. It wasn't gear. It was just here at Canon, we've got a proud heritage of blah, blah, blah. It was boring as batshit. So <laughs> what had happened is you know, in that time, you know, I worked in the pro team. I'd, I'd worked up through my time at Nikon and got poached by Canon to come over and work in the pro team for them. And I was like, I'm not going to leave Canon pro team to go and work for this consumer junk. And mm. the boss at the time that, that had come up with the concept of Canon Collective is like, would you come and work for us? I'm like, well, I don't know. Like, I think you could be doing better things. You know, what if we do tours like I already do? And you know, in my head, I'm like, I want to go and not use my annual leave so I can actually have holidays with my wife for a change instead of, you know, make it make it work. So yep. he's like, oh, do you think it'll work? And I'm like, say yes and I'll show you. So, you know, we ended up with bigger experiences and tours as a result of, of that. So it really did turn a corner. I joined at the same time as Greg Sullivan in Queensland, who's now one of my business partners with the Photography Workshop Co., and I know between the two of us, we just sat down when the job offer came through because they wanted to expand the team. And I remember talking to Greg and just saying, what are you going to do? We both worked in the in the CAN professional team. And I'm mm. like, I don't really want to leave the pro team for this. Like, And both of us agreed. It's like if we can get what we want out of it and we can do better, exciting stuff, then, yeah, I'd, I'd jump over. And yeah. that's it became a whole different beast because of that. So, Do you think maybe Canon saw the writing on the wall as far as pro – photographers being a um not no, certainly not a dying breed um but in terms of newspaper photographers and things like that it, it was shrinking um so moving resources you know extremely skilled and experienced people like yourself moving them from rather than being pro support but really engaging with passionate um amateurs in, in experiences 
was a way for Canon to kind of shift their resources towards, um, yeah, I guess away from that traditional newspaper pro to the person that go, wants to go and experience Africa um, yeah. for the first time or whatever. Do you think it was, was that part of it or was it? Yeah. Yes, in a way, like the newspaper business was a big chunk. So there was newspaper and government business, which is you know a very big thing, not only for for Canon, but Nikon as well. So mm. having worked for both companies in those pro teams and seeing where the priorities were, it was very different back then because the shelf life of a pro model, like a one series camera, they were five or six years. So a newspaper, if you take, say, News Limited as an example or Getty, is they all buy on CapEx. So every year yep. money comes around, they've got to spend it. Mm-hmm. And once they've all got that latest model, unless they <laughs> increased the, the number of staff, and there was a period probably mid-2000s where there was a mass redundancy in news because digital mm. had made things quicker and easier and speed and immediacy changed. And that was probably only about three years after that after they'd already cut the workforce in half of full-time phot- photographic staff, it yeah. halved again, and then video came on board. So yeah. I remember when the 5D Mark II came out, I was like, who wants a compact camera consumer feature in an SLR? And, man, that took off. But <laughs> it, it just changed the game. But I think the Canon yeah. Collective thing, the whole point of it was brand advocacy because pros use what they use for a reason, but consumers are swayed differently on their choice of products. Yes. And it was solely, it kind of sat, it wasn't marketing and it wasn't sales. It was something in between in a way. And it was mm. really to build brand advocacy and it did work. I mean, there was some customers that turned up to early workshops that had, you know, an, an old 7D and, you know, 100 to 300 EF, you know, your little kit lenses and stuff. Yeah, and this yeah. one this one customer now owns an R3, an R5, a 600ml F4, like, you're yeah. talking 30 grand investment in gear that up until that point, he didn't know he needed it until he used it. So exactly. the recipe of Canon Collective worked really well for that reason. But at the same token, it started out earlier on where all the workshops were free. So mm. you'd find you just get the same people getting the tickets. And then because they're not invested, they just wouldn't turn up sometimes. Yeah. So we started charging for it and, you know, it became a revenue. But in its final sort of death throes, it was just maintaining a program. It wasn't about making profits. So they were affordable Mm. experiences. And then the bigger tours and workshops like my Lake Air trips, the the Africa tours. I mean, Greg took um, a trip to Croatia. Uh, Scott took a trip to Japan. Uh, There was trips to Antarctica, a whole bunch of Mm. stuff that went under the Canon Collective banner. But this was stuff that I was, you know, obviously doing before Canon. And then I just said, how can I make this work for me without having to use manual leave, turn it into work? And that's what I did. So perfect. And then when it all, yeah, when it all collapsed, I'm like, I don't want to go back to a full-time job. I want to keep doing this. And that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Yeah. Doing that. It's Mm. perfect. What about this? Where was this? So that's in the Okavango Delta in Botswana. So that was before Canon. So that was me working with, so Shem, you see the guy at the back in the blue long sleeve shirt on, on the right yep. hand side. So he's the other owner of C4. So he's, you know, the guy that owns the hides as well. So him and Andre, the, the two guys that run that company. Yep. Um, and then there's a fellow in the middle with a hat on with a shadow across his face. Yeah, Dennis. So yep. Dennis Glennon who I'd done a lot of the early uh, photographic tours, which changed the model and how I did them. So the first supported trip that I ran was for a wholesaler in Sydney that just sold African travel. And this was before there was really an industry for photo tours. There really was a handful of people doing it and they weren't advertised. Travel agents didn't sell it because no one was coming into a travel agent asking for something that was still fairly new in the industry. And I was running my own tours with this company and it was kind of the the lower end of medium in budget and experience. And at that time, again, working for Canon Professional Services, I got a call from Dennis one day who's based over in Perth and he said, I just wanted to have a quick chat about Africa, maybe give me a call after work. And I was like, oh, you're interested in joining me on a trip? He's like, no, I'm interested in you working on mine. (laughs) So Dennis just did high end. It was private aircraft, five star all the way. And if you've got one competitor in the market, you're not competing with the 50 people trying to get the middle to low end market. Mm -hmm. And I kind of modeled how I, how I work now, basically off what I learned from Dennis who, um, 
you know, was a high-end businessman, the CEO of major corporations his whole life. So oh, wow. got a, okay. a lot in the way that I hold myself professionally in business has definitely come from what I learned from Dennis, yeah. Man. Who years going and through Canon, there was a project that Dennis did with Tony Hewitt called Girt by Sea that was done a few years ago. So they actually flew the entire coastline of Australia in about 38 days and photographed aerial photography all the way around. And that was a project that Dennis had wanted to work on with Tony. So I mean, if you don't know Tony Hewitt, look him up. He's, he's won photographic awards through Australia end on end for, for landscape and aerial work. But even yeah. with world photo competitions, so WPPI, so World Photography Awards, yep. he won first, second and third one year in landscape. What? So... You know, he was a Nikon user and I remember at the time Dennis said, what do you think of this concept? And I said, look, you know, I'll have a chat to the, the director at the time and they started chatting and next minute, yeah, if you use some Canon cameras, Dennis already used Canon, but um, we ended up getting Tony Hewitt onto Canon gear for, for this project, which, you know, he was staunch wow. Nikon user. Um, he uses phase one for most of his stuff now anyway, but okay. this whole project was shot on 5D Mark IVs and 1DX Mark IIs at the time. But, uh, yeah, look up and, Girt by C. Yeah, okay. I'll have mm. to check it out. That sounds – I didn't even know that project existed. Yeah. So well, it was, cool turned into a, it was turned into a book. So the website, I believe, still has books available and prints as well, but um, some stunning stuff. All abstract yeah. aerial, yeah. yeah. And when they did the opening, I mean, Canon helped fund it and supported it, but when it went around the exhibition, it didn't have the location under the prints. So the catalogue uh, where you could buy them had the information of where it was taken. But on the walkthrough, I mean, they had Julie Bishop open the exhibition in Sydney. And on the walkthrough that we did, and they had, you know, a lot of special guests and dignitaries turn up on the night, they walked through and they were asked, where do you think this is taken? And you'd see mm. turquoise water and bright orange sand, and they're like, oh, that's got to be somewhere in the Pilbara and WA. We're like, no, nope, that was in Tasmania. So yeah. on the walkthrough, they deliberately challenge you to think where you think it might be, and you were off every single time. It's just phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have to check it out. That sounds great. That's, yeah, definitely. Yeah. The book the book is stunning. I mean, I've got a copy on my bookshelf. It is absolutely mm. stunning. Yeah. Have to see if I can still order a copy. Yeah, that sounds mm. amazing, especially like doing the entire coastline. That's yeah, that's unreal. And just logistics behind it, because up in the top end, they had to have fuel dumps yep. hidden. You know, they basically had to fly backwards and forwards and then have that fuel supply moved into strategic spots, and it was planned mm. to the dollar. So once they got to the end, they had to account for bad weather, wind, using more fuel based on that weather. I mean, they were literally leaving early in locations to avoid storms and get ahead of things. And when it got to the end, and this is, you know, the pedigree of where Dennis has come from and high-end business, mm. nearly to the dollar he'd budgeted where, you know, he, he didn't have to get halfway through and dig into his own pocket or go back to Canon, who was the major sponsor, asking for more money. It yep. literally was on budget 38 days. Wow. Mm. Planned perfectly. Yeah. Phenomenal. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, what about this one? So this is down in Victoria, actually, in Cape Shanks. So it's a common location. I run my long exposure workshops. So we, I am an ambassador with Hayda Filters. So we do hand out full kits to customers. So they've got, you know, $1,500 full ND filter kit from Hayda um, for the, the duration of those workshops. So it is a cool location. I mean, low tide, if anyone's looking this location up, uh, you've got to know it. You, there's mm -hmm. twice that I've ever been to this point because of, where the swell comes in. You need a very, very flat, low calm, low tide day to even walk near that spot. To get out there. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's no way. You'd be neck deep in water and being smashed to death by by waves and rocks if you tried to get to that point. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Mm. Uh, I will skip through some of that. More Africa. Yeah, Actually, that's Namibia. So that was Namibia? yep towards the end of one of those trips. So that was actually off the back of a few years ago. Canon had a competition called the Canon Light Awards, and it was done that. in yeah, it was done in cinemas in in each state where you had three cinemas and three photographers that had a three hour talk. Then they'd set a brief, and you had twenty four hours to submit your image. Then there was a state grand final, and then the overall grand final was the winner of each state were flown into Tasmania. They didn't know that they were going to Tassie. They were just told to meet at the airport and what to pack. 
then they had two days to shoot a folio of five images. And I think the brief was hit the hidden Tasmania. And then the winner won a trip to Africa with my, my good self. So that was, oh, wow. was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's unreal. It's, it's so, yeah. So many cool things that were happening that, I mean, I guess you had to be plugged in to be, to be hearing about it. I remember hearing about the light awards, but I, I don't remember the, yeah, the, that level of prizes and, and that sort of stuff. That's yeah. Yeah. And it was the yeah. guy, the guy fourth in from the left, uh, Alistair McBurney. He was uh, the lucky winner in the mint colored shirt. There. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Wow. A absolute character. Still, still a great mate. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Uh, let's talk about Antarctica. Because you went this year? Uh, yeah, in February. In February? Tell me about it. There are no words that explain it and give it justice, I can tell you that. Like I've had, you know, 18 years of seeing Africa and it's not like it's uh, seeing the same thing. It's different. Every country is different. I mean, every trip even to the same location. I've been, you know, Mashatu pretty much year on year since 2007 and still see different stuff every time I go. But more or less, it's the same wildlife and, and similar landscape. While you get really landscape um, differences, I found when the wildlife's not doing something and you're in an area that's scrubby bush, your jaw's not on the ground in, in wow all day. Mm. Whereas Antarctica, you're literally doing this every five minutes because you're just mind blown by what you're seeing. You're surrounded by ice and icebergs. And if there is no wildlife, this, the landscape alone is enough to, to knock you off your feet. It's phenomenal. Well, spe speaking of which, this this image, I can't stop looking at. It's the one that we use for the thumbnail of this uh, yeah. this video. Like, is this is this what it looked like? Have you edited yeah. this? Like, is this, is this what you see when you when you go down there? That's fairly much straight out of camera. That's about 11.30 at night. Oh, wow. So but that was in their summer. So you, you don't get the longest days. So you generally find November, December as the longest days. It's almost 24 hours of daylight. You don't The sun doesn't set. Whereas once you get to sort of mid to late January, it might be dark for about three hours. So sun would set around 11. Then you'd get that sort of last bit of light around 11.30. And then around 3 to 3.30 a.m., you'd get that blue hour light for about two hours before sunrise because it just skims the horizon. So it's just sitting just mm. below the horizon and then it pops up again. So I found on this night, we're going through the Gillard Strait. So there you've got towering cliffs on your left-hand side, or depending if you're going in or out of this particular location. But you're in there the whole night. So we had dinner on the deck outside that night, a barbecue. And everyone had finished dinner, went up to the front of the ship for a couple of drinks and whatnot. And you've just got this barrage of icebergs on the horizon that are just getting bigger and bigger and bigger as you're cruising on towards them. And one by one, it's getting colder as it's getting later. People are peeling off and going to bed. And I found myself probably the last one left for nearly three hours where I couldn't walk away. I couldn't go back to my room and go to sleep because I was like, oh, let's just see what the next iceberg looks like. And this is like after the first couple of days and yeah, you've just got the next one comes up, you know, you're tired, you know, you're getting up at four thirty, five 5 o'clock the next morning and you just can't peel yourself away from it. It's phenomenal. Wow. wow. It's mm. look, I, ever since I saw, I think I've, I've watched a YouTube video of someone that went on one, on a, on a trip to Antarctica. And ever since then I've, I've just been sort of hooked on it, but it, it's such a huge investment, especially for two people to go. Like it's, it's, yeah, it's a pretty serious chunk of money to get down there. And um, the other thing is this, this question in the chat is actually perfect for it. I'd love to go, but I'm damn sure I'd be seasick for two weeks. What's the deal with getting down there? I have a solution for you. We fly in, we don't sail. So what options you have now is, this product that we use for a company called Antarctica 21, they were the pioneers of what's known as the air cruise. So we fly from Chile. So from Punta Arenas, we fly a two hour flight to an island called King George Island. And from King George Island, that's the very southern tip of what is known as the Drake Passage. So anyone that's mm. looked into going to Antarctica has heard about the dreaded Drake Passage, which is I the have. roughest ocean in the world, right? So... 
that's normally a two-day sail from Ushuaia to get into the Antarctic Peninsula. We get there in two hours, not two days. And when you arrive, you're already in calm seas. So the whole time you're in the Antarctic Peninsula, it's all in sheltered coves. And the ship will, based on weather and wind and other things, will stick to locations that are protected to avoid any rough seas. So by the time you get back to King George Island, you fly back home again in two hours and not two days. So all in all, you're saving four days, which if you sail down, you've got four days at sea where you've got nothing to do but to be seasick. Hmm. So seasickness, not a problem if you do it the way that I, I take my clients in personally. Okay, okay. So there's got to be there's got to be some um, downsides or something something to it. But what's um, what are the negatives to flying in? Is it, do you miss out on anything? Is it, is it double the price? What what why aren't why doesn't everyone fly in? So yes, it's more expensive, but from a two hour flight, you land and by day one you're in Antarctica. Whereas normally the two days at sea, there's no icebergs, there's nothing to see for two days but open ocean and, you know, 15 to 20 foot, 30 foot swell. Yeah. So you're not missing anything. And when the drake is really rough, you can't even go outside on the balcony. You're literally sitting in your room strapped like a seatbelt in bed essentially mm. with a vomit with a vomit bucket mm. taped to your face. So, yeah. you know, for the extra cost, you know, people will look at the cost and say, you know, six days in Antarctica. I've, I've seen a tour that's three grand cheaper and it's 12 days. It's like, okay, uh, but four, I see. four days of that is just getting there and back. And what what happens is the advantage for us is when you, when you arrive at King George Island, overnight you're sailing as far south into the peninsula as possible. So when you wake up the next morning, for the rest of the trip, you're slowly making your way back up in the peninsula at two different locations every single day. Right. Whereas you'll find the sail option, you're sailing all the way down. You can't go as far because you have to turn around and get back in time. So we go further south as possible because we're getting there a lot faster. So you can afford to not burn up as much time getting down in order to get back. And then the other advantage we use with this ship here, the Ocean Nova, it only takes 67 total passengers. So I'm responsible for, say, up to 10s about the minimum that I'd take. And that ensures that only 67 passengers in total. There's a law throughout Antarctica that wherever one ship is, you won't see another ship. So there could be 30 or 40 different cruises happening in and around you at any given time. But to anchor up and go on a shore landing, you can be the only ship there. So you go whole days without seeing another ship at all because yep. the, the law and the rule is you can't have more than 100 people at that bit of land at any given time. So the disadvantage on, yeah, you might find a cheaper trip, but you're on a ship with two or 300 passengers. That means it's parked at one location for a whole day and you have to wait your turn in order to go on to a landing. So for two or three hours in the morning, while half of the ship is out on land, you're sitting listening to penguin lectures and killing time mm. in order to wait your turn. Then you go out, you do your landing, you come back, then overnight the ship will move. Now the difference for us is we pull up to a location with 67 total passengers within 20 minutes. We're in Zodiacs and we're on shore. Mm. Then when we get back, they move the ship as we're having brunch we get to the afternoon, we're out in another landing. So we're actually getting two unique locations a day for three hours in the morning, three hours in the afternoon. Right. And how many days total of, of that sort of activity? So you've got pretty much five days in Antarctica, mm -hmm. but the first and the last day is getting to and from King George Island. So you've essentially okay. got four days with two three-hour landings a day. So you've got eight three-hour landings in different locations every single time. Okay. Yeah. For that and, cost. And, yeah. yeah. And, th and that's the primary activity of what you're going down there is, is for those eight uh, landings. And, and yeah. obviously the in-between, the scenery that you see from the trip in between each spot is also you yeah. know, an amazing part of the journey. Yeah. I guess that's the other benefit too is if, if the ship's sort of moving each day, you're enjoying sort of a change of scenery on the ship rather than that happening while you're asleep. Yeah. So I the ship, like that iceberg shot you pulled up, that was taken just on the move. That was after dinner and on the ship. So yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that so yeah, you don't necessarily have to be out in a zodiac to get sort of beautiful scenery, beautiful images. You no. Just be, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, wow. Let me just have a look. What about this? Was where was yeah, this just was, taken from the ship? Yeah, from the ship. That was on the same night as the other iceberg, but you know, a little bit later. But that sunset sort of light hangs around a lot longer than. You know, when we see sunset and it sort of disappears, you get 20 minutes of that colour pop and then it fades off. You get about an hour and a half of it there because the sun's just skimming along the horizon before it drops Yeah. because you're so far south. So you get that quality of light for a good chunk of your afternoon every day. Every day. Mm. And that's dream. why oh, it is. And that's why I favour February personally. So it's coming to the very end of the season because by the time it comes to March – you get longer. You probably got six hours of, of night. And then after March, then, you know, you'll go through where you only get one hour of daylight and it's dark for the whole of this, their winter. Yep. So why I favour February is you get more melt, which means there's more exposed land, which means there's more um, penguins that have nested and their chicks have reared by that, uh, by that time. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you go in, say, December, there's more pack ice around but that's when the penguins are just starting to breed. So they haven't got the nests yet. So a lot mm. of the time they're still out in the water feeding. So you don't get them up on the ice and, and on the land. So when you do your landings, you don't have the mass numbers of, of penguins around. Right. Whereas February, the chicks have all reared and they're all starting to fledge. And if you're lucky, there are some locations. So the further north you are on the peninsula, they fledge a little bit earlier. And if you're lucky, I mean, not lucky for them, but you see predation going on with the leopard seals chasing, you know, penguins that have entered the water for the first time and you realize that happy feet isn't all fun (laughs) (laughs) yeah there's still the natural order of things yeah real that's that's everything so all the other predators the orcas as well and we had orcas on a couple of sightings every species of whale are there at that time because that's when all of the food's in the water so i really favored february if you're there for wildlife and you're still going to get killer landscape killer light and icebergs that I find February very hard to beat, whereas you'd probably find people that were there just for landscape and icebergs, you'd probably go in December if wildlife wasn't, if that was a secondary interest. But if you want a yeah. best of both, then I'd definitely say February. Yeah. February. <laughs> is it? Uh, is this another one of those things where you need that 600 mil lens if you want to be able to no. get up, up close to wildlife? Not at all. That was just, yeah, 100 to 400. So it was really? probably only, I mean, you get right up to the side of these things. They, they're they not that worried by you. They've got no predator except for orcas. Yeah. So, you know, anything walking on land or floating around on the surface of the water, they they couldn't care less about you. They're not, yeah. not nervous at all. No. Just looks so funny. Such a, like, yeah. Uh, looks like a comedy animal. Like just. <laughs> well, that's the thing. Like, they kind of look cute and endearing until they open their mouth they've got these mm. big yellow big mouthful of razor sharp teeth so Ooh. yeah <laughs> they're the only sort of intimidating looking seal the others all look you know cute whereas leopard seals they they mean business they're killers they, yeah right yeah yeah orcas this is just it's yeah and then you see this image and you're like all right i gotta go i have to go yeah but- and i was just, you know, I went for the wildlife and fell in love with the icebergs. It's probably one way to put it. As much as the wildlife had the impact I expected and beyond expectations, if I'm honest, I didn't expect to be so overwhelmed by icebergs. I was addicted, yeah. hooked. As I said, I was standing there probably minus 10 degrees. I had the option of going to bed and I couldn't walk away from the view. I just had to shoot the next iceberg just in case it was a good one. You know, it was mm. addictive. Yeah. Did you come back? Were you uh, sleep deprived when you got back? Pretty much. I mean, it's, Africa's the same. You get back from a trip and you need a holiday. So, yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's crazy. So that last shot you saw there is actually in a place called Deception Island, which it's funnily this- enough, yeah, it's an old whaling station. So those were the old boilers that they used to boil all the whale blubber and and get all the whale oil because oh. back in you know, the 30s, 40s, 50s, even up to the 60s, whale oil and whatnot was used in a lot of cosmetics and things. And through like the 50s and whatnot, it was used in London, New York, in all of the streetlights and the lanterns. They were all lit by using whale oil. And then 
over years, I mean, electricity changed that and then consumer sentiment for whales changed and the whole whale oil industry died as a result. But this station here was just abandoned and left, and that is actually in the mouth of an undersea volcano. So you'll see it's all black sand. Mm. So when you turn up to this location, the ship there was the ship shot that you saw, you saw earlier with that cliff edge. That is actually the rim of a volcano. So in the ship, you actually sail between these two headlands into this big moon-shaped bay, and that is literally a volcano crater. So you, you turn up on this beach and there's steam pouring out of the sand. It's because it's, it's heat. You, you dig your hand into the sand and it's hot. Really? All of, so it's an yeah, active volcano? Active volcano, yeah. I think the last time it went off was in the 60s possibly. And there was an airstrip, there was an airstrip built in there, but it's got a dog leg in it. So the planes used to have to land and then turn to get around because there was nowhere long enough because the beach is round. Mm. But all of the remnants are still there. There's huge big whale oil tankers, big drums at the side. And it's just, yeah, it's like this apocalyptic scene of just a, a yeah. trashed society with wildlife wandering around inside. And we're the only ones there. You, know, you wander around in this location and there is nothing for days. Does it, it truly kind of feel like you're doing something um, actually out of the ordinary? Yeah, it, yeah. A really new experience that, yeah. you know, you can't just you can't just Google what it's like or, or yeah. whatever. You really have to be there. Well, it's just the scale of it is different, you know, because you can see wildlife images of something sitting next to a tree and you've seen a tree before, but you've never seen an iceberg. So it's hard to really quantify exactly what the experience is like until you've seen it yeah. it's very very hard to put into words and i even looked at images of and video footage that i'd taken of the actual trip and while it brings back memories it, i sit and remember what it looked like in my head not by looking at my images because it's different it's yeah. the only way i can describe it is that the experience in real life versus the pictures it it just evokes your memory to to what it actually looked like and yeah, it's just phenomenal. It really is. Trip of a lifetime. Yeah, I mean, hopefully it'll be one of many, but I've got yeah. some tickets available for next year's trip uh, still available. So, so anyway, going it's, a, again in February? Same time, yeah. 6th six, six to the 13th of February next year. 6th to the 13th. And and tell me, let's, like, let's talk gear again. Um, here you are with the uh, 100 to 400, I assume. Mm-hmm um what what's required for an antarctica trip to make the most of it if you're going on a photography tour yep so if you look you a lot of the time you're wearing gloves so i use the the valorette gloves which i know that yep. uh, you've got some involvement with here in australia as well we do we've got more stock on the way we've been out for a little while but it's coming yep fantastic so i find changing lenses and things when it's cold and you've got gloves and as much as they are dexterous when you put your fingertips through the ends, you don't really want to be changing lenses, especially in the Zodiac. It just takes one spray or one little lump in the water and before you know it, salt water's in your camera. So I found the 24 to 105 or the 15 to 35 on one body, mm-hmm. particularly if you're in the Zodiacs next to towering icebergs, I just had the 15 to 35 on one and the 100 to 400 on the second camera. I'd go as far okay. to say that the 24 to 105, I probably used it for half an hour out of the whole trip. The whole trip, otherwise, was 100 to 400 on the R3 and 15 to 35 on the R5. Mm. You didn't and need much more. Do you need every bit of that 100 to 400 um, focal length? Or no. could, like, could you get away with it with, say, a 70 to 200, 2.8 yep. on an R5 body and just crop in a little bit? Yeah, you could. I mean, sometimes like with whales or something like that that are further off, then Mm -hmm. every bit of reach helps. But on land, the penguins are right next to you. I mean, you can literally sit down. You can't sit on the ground at the time we were there because there was some um, bird influenza that could affect colonies. So Mm. before you get on and off the ship, like you're loaned the boots essentially. I've actually got a pair here, these. Oh, yeah. I went out and bought a bought a pair this week <laughs> because they're so <laughs> bloody good and they're completely waterproof you can stand up to your knees in the water and water won't get through and they'll keep your feet warm down to minus 40 okay but when you get back on the ship there's two big troughs full of detail and scrubbing brush sort of things you sit there and scrub your boots before you go back on so when you get to the next location you're not spreading any 
um, parasites or diseases that might be in a colony. So yeah. with that said, normally you could sit on the ground because it's so cold, it's dry. Yeah. So people get worried about, oh, what happens if my gear gets covered in snow? It's so cold, it doesn't melt. So it's actually dry. It just falls off like powder. Okay. So in that regard, because of the outbreak of some of the, the possible diseases with birds, you weren't allowed to kneel or you weren't allowed to sit. You could squat down. You just couldn't have your knees, hands, or your backside touching snow. Okay. Um, so with that, you know, the flip out screen, you just bend down and get ground down shots. And, mm -hmm. you know, you had baby baby penguins walking all the way up, almost pecking at your lens. Yeah. So you don't need super long lenses because I was wanting to take my 600 mil. Mm. And there's a, there was an onboard photographer that works for the cruise company that they go out on all of the activities and landings and they photograph the guests. And then there's a big slideshow on the final night with, you know, an open bar. Oh, yeah. And then you get a copy of all of those images because, you know, you're on this trip of a lifetime. You know, some people will just be carrying a selfie stick or a 360 cam filming their whole experience. But mm. what the nice touch is by the end, you get a login and you can download all the photos. So, you know, your yeah. friend's like, oh, you know, show me a photo of you in Antarctica. That's all handled for you. And, and I'll, I'll do that for my guests as, as a nice bonus surprise at the end. It's, you know, here's a bunch of photos that I took. You didn't know they were taken, but here you go, enjoy them. But, um, yeah, you, know, you don't need a lot of big gear for the sheer fact that the wildlife's not scared of you and you're walking amongst them. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so you would say a, a reasonably sort of versatile long lens, um, and and like we've said, probably two camera bodies just in case yeah. you know you drop one in the water off the side of the ship or something. Yeah. Uh, you don't want your photography trip to be over. Yeah. Um, and then a wide lens yeah. of some sort, and you kind of you're done. And you've got like stunning quality of light all day, so you mm. don't have to worry. There's no shadows. There's no trees. There's no shade to worry about. So. You know, in in saying that, you don't need two point eight lenses. Is what I'm getting at. So, okay, you know, the one hundred to four hundred barely got over two or even four hundred ISO most of the time because oh. part of me, you know, if you've you've had a lot of experience shooting in the snow, I know you've done a lot of stuff mm -hmm. with snowboarding and, and and whatnot. Everything's reflecting. You're not yeah. worrying about fill. It's all perfect. So. Yeah, you know, unless you get those blue sky days and you, you do get some harsh contrast, but it, even then, it's we, pretty good with the with the fill yeah. of snow. Usually, like it's still still pretty easy. Like, yeah, you don't need insane dynamic range no. uh, like you do if you're trying to do the same thing. I uh, shouldn't forest for mountain biking and stuff. And if it's like yeah. harsh dappled light coming through trees, but there's nothing that reflecting sucks. it, it's brutal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So okay, yeah. that's good. Yeah, to know. it's the type of thing that you know anything you point your lens at looks like. A postcard shot it looks like the photos you saw in the brochure that made you want to go and yep. there's nothing to do to them and we had a lot of overcast skies on our particular trip which in february you know you will get a bit more dramatic weather starting the wind starts to pick up and other things whereas you find through december it's just big blue skies every day so i would prefer clouds and drama any day over blue skies because you won't get yeah. stuff like this so again yep. that's why i favor february over december to get this kind of look yeah, that iceberg. Yeah, this uh, is big ethereal looking things. So I just just absolutely hooked. After the first sighting of an iceberg, I was just nuts for them. <laughs> yeah, I love it. <laughs> it's, yeah, I'm. Oh, it's definitely on the list. I don't know if I can make it by February. It is. It is like I said. It's a big investment, um, especially once you look into the you know flying. Um, you know, just flying across before you actually board the plane to, to go on your tour, um, yeah. all of that adds up. Um, so it's something you really need to be prepared for financially. But it's good to know that you, you don't need to invest in um, giant lenses to make the most of it um, no. as long as you've got sort of decent gear. That, th this one popped up. So so you're saying you don't – what like weather ceiling on your bodies and lenses, how critical is it uh, for Antarctica? So not critical really for the fact that it doesn't rain. You know, if it rains, it turns into snow, so you don't get mm -hmm. rain as such. So sleet and any moisture that will build up in your camera is, is not a problem. When mm -hmm. you're in the zodiacs, if it's mm -hmm. windy or you're going into chop, then you might get splashes over the front of the boat. Yep. So if you're going to shore landings, then I just take a dry bag. So I got a big roll top dry bag. I actually got it from um, Adrena, you know, those the outdoor dive Shops, Adreno, I think they're called. Mm -hmm. And I could fit my whole camera backpack into it. Yep. 
and it's a roll top that's completely waterproof. So the reason I do that is when you get on and off the ship, there's just a little pontoon and a big open door off the side of the ship. So if it was rough or you slipped and you dropped a bag or you fell off the Zodiac for any given reason, mm. it floats and your gear's rescued. So yep. what I find is when you're doing photography from the Zodiacs, it's when you're in a on a calm day and you're not going to get the splashes and things. So if it's choppy, just put your gear in a dry bag. So you might mm. get to a point where you don't even take a camera bag on a shore landing. You just have two cameras with a camera strap throw them in the dry bag and when you get on land you can leave the dry bag at the shore with the zodiacs you walk mm. around for three hours with you know spare batteries and things in your pockets or you know a spare yeah. lens in your pocket and not worry about a bag so that's one way to do it but you certainly don't need housings or waterproof jackets and stuff on your on your lenses and, and the good thing is each landing is three hours and you decide what you want to do so the Guides will get on land, you know, 20 or 30 minutes before we go on land and they'll mark off three different walks with some neon flags. So they'll stick them in and you can either go up the mountain that side, along the beach that side or up the mountain that side. So in that three hours, you can get to all locations comfortably and walk around and do whatever you want. If you're not overly fit or don't want to tackle the climb, you can just stay on the shoreline surrounded by penguins. You might get on for the first hour and then think, oh, I want to go and do a Zodiac cruise and get close to some icebergs and find some leopard seals on icebergs. Then you just go to the shore and all of the Zodiacs are on shore. And if you're the only one there that wants to go, the driver will go, no problem, jump in, let's go. And again, that's the beauty of the program we run. You choose, It's like choose your own adventure. You do what you want when you want. That sounds great. Yeah. Sounds very cool. And then would you, um, in terms of being part of a, a photography-oriented group on the tour, um, which so there's there's 60-something people on the, on the ship, but there's a, a small group with you that are part of your tour. Do you guys... Um, how interact you know outside of these landings to have a look at photos and talk about that kind of stuff how does that work yeah look we have so in between landings on the ship i mean you've got it's a visual assault all day and because <laughs> it doesn't get dark till late you know if you draw your blinds you've got blackout blinds in your rooms because every room's got a portal to to see outside but i found i couldn't draw it closed because i felt like i was missing something so I'm, yeah. I'm falling asleep with full light pumping through and then it's full light again by about four o'clock in the morning. And I'd find myself just drifting off to sleep and I'd be like, oh, I wonder what's happening outside. And you turn around, look out the porthole and go back to sleep again. So you were kind of, you know, always you couldn't drag yourself away from from what was going on. But um, sorry, what was the question? I've gone probably well, off topic. I'll, I'll come back to it but before you get to that. Um, so you're saying, when was the first time you went to Antarctica? This year. So I'd actually it, it had, was yeah, I'd had four opportunities to go in the past that clashed with other things. So for any oh, reason, okay. it just, just didn't happen for me. So, yeah. And you're telling me that you've, you've been to Africa for 16 years, was it? 18 years, 18 years this year. Eight, yeah. 18 years. You photographed in tons of other countries, worked for Canon, worked for Nikon, and you went to Antarctica this year and you were still getting like FOMO through the night of, that you might be missing out on yeah. a, a beautiful photo. Yeah. And I think you know, that partly might be because it was a new experience, but in all honesty, I could go a hundred days straight and I'd still be doing it every day because yeah. again, it was the icebergs that would get me. I was like, I just had in my head, I wanted this collection of solo icebergs with no other clutter, just an iceberg and doomy skies. And I could just see them as a, a collection or a print series. So that's, it was kind of, it came to me very early in the trip that that was a priority for me as a collection of images that I wanted to start to capture. Yeah. Yeah. I can just, yeah. If a location can inspire someone that's, that's seen so many things already and done so many things, then it's obviously got, you know, something special about it. Yeah. Um, well, to me, I find it's important to anchor yourself into having a project or a long-term project in hand and Africa, I've got a long-term project that I, that I shoot but being a first trip to Antarctica, I was like, okay, this is trip one. I want to try and anchor into something that every trip I can add to a collection. So with Africa, it didn't start for me until 2010, taking portraits of male lions that are compositionally identical. And I'm going to bring them up. 
Brings it up bring for them, sure. I'll bring them up on the screen. These are the other thing that when I, when you sent these photos through, I wasn't. It actually wasn't until I opened them up full screen. Um, yeah, I I don't know. I don't know if this stream will do them justice, but uh, sure. it's like they're staring straight through me. So this only works with male lines because you'll see with the mane, it fills in the blank areas. Mm. Whereas a female lion or a leopard or a different species of cat without a mane, you're going to get background. Yes. So this one is just the same composition, direct eye contact and symmetrical. And you, I've got thousands of lions that I've photographed that don't meet the collection because their heads are on an angle, their eyes aren't straight to camera. Uh, the focal length was different. So the compression looks different. You know, these are all shot very same distance with the same composition. So the plan for me in the end is that whether this be an exhibition or a book, imagine these printed A1 or AO mm. and standing in a room and turning around and just having direct eye contact with, with lines. So it's only the character that changes, yeah. Yeah, it'll it'll be a beautiful exhibition. Uh, I, yeah. uh, what what? How will you know when it's done? I didn't know for years. I'll, I'll, when I see the last one, I'll kind of have a feeling. But in my head, I want to try and get to 100. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I thought you might so, say um, 30 or something or 20. No, 100. Well, I, just, I just think once you get to those sort of numbers, it just gives you – it would be like trying to take 30 portraits of different looking people. It, it doesn't cover enough variety. Mm. Whereas you'll have some lines that look quite similar and you get others that, I mean, there's one in here when you get there, you'll know the one. He had a buffalo horn through his face two days before we got there. And that was the first one in the series. So in this, 2010. The, this one's like, um, it, the, it's like he's sad. Yeah. Oh, it's, <laughs> he's seen some stuff. But yeah, in, in saying that, he hasn't had a lot of action because he's still got quite a clean face. Mm. And you'll generally find by the time lions develop a full mane, they're already at the age that they're competing for territory and they've probably been kicked out of their own pride by their own father. So by then, they've already copped some, some battle scars. Yeah. So this guy was part of a bigger pride. And if your pride's big, you're really not going to get missed with by an outsider. Whereas mm. you'll find lions that have just brutally torn to pieces they're generally the only dominant male and they might have had a coalition of males. And there was a period of about 10 years in an area in Botswana where they had a pride of lions that killed probably 100 lions by overthrowing prides. And there was oh, this wow. coalition of, it was these five males, these five brothers that just decimated lion populations because what happens is when they overthrow a pride, they kill all of the cubs to sire their own. So not only were they either chasing off or killing the dominant males, and what will happen is the cubs will get wiped out as well. So some of the females, if they get away with their cubs, they go. But straight away, the females then go into estrus and mate with them because they're a stronger competitor. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these things have come in and killed their cubs, yet straight away they're like, oh, all right, okay, well, let's have some kids of our own. So that's... You know, if, if you believe in reincarnation, you don't want to come back as a lion. It's not oh. not a good life. Sounds rough. But he was the first in the series. So I edited that particular picture and I, I just sort of looked at it. And this was in 2010. And I thought, I'm going to try and get another one of these on the trip. And I, I managed a second one on that same trip. But, you know, I've been on trips where I've got none. So it's mm. not an easy thing to get. I mean, you know, high frame rate plays a hand in it but again it just takes that slightest difference in angle where the head's not completely symmetrical for it to not work i can imagine yeah it's like you can't just can't just wave a stake at them or something to get them to look at the camera it's no. like yeah or is it is it just luck like how do you how do you yeah, you, yeah you're just ready ready looking for it and and hopefully they look at you yep and it depends on the situation i mean most of the time these things are flat out asleep with droopy eyes because they're just sitting there panting in the heat Mm -hmm. So it takes, you know, conditions. It takes, you know, at what phase these things probably sleep for 22 hours of a day. Mm -hmm. So you've just got to be there in good light at the right time when they're actually awake and active. And yeah, it's just luck. This first shot was with a 600 mil? No, so that was the 500 F4 with that one. So oh, all okay. of them up until I recently, I only got my 600 mil in 2021. Mm -hmm. um, so I've used my 500 F4 on every trip up until then. So everyone in the collection, except for the last five that I got, were on a 500 F4, and now it's with a 600. 
Yeah. And 2010, so this would have been like a what camera? That would have been... X? No, it was before the 1DX. So that would have been, I reckon, it's either the 1D Mark III or the 1D Mark IV would be one or the Mm. other. Yeah. Isn't Isn't it fun to look back through images like this and... You know, I'm I'm only looking at I'm looking at on my laptop screen at the moment, which is a you know it's a retina screen. Looks beautiful, super sharp, just great. But it's a camera, a 14 year old camera. Yeah. That that, least, that I I wouldn't be out. You know, I I couldn't shoot with that now. It, it wouldn't do the job. You know. Oh, they do though. But, they hold up just ex- fine. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I've got I've got a one one D Mark IV sitting on the shelf there. Yeah. Um, which I play around with every now and then, but um. Yeah, it's nice to look back through images sometimes and, and see a great image and go, yeah, I don't need a new camera. Yeah, even better. I mean, I use, you know, proper calibrated high-end professional monitors, but mm. the thing to keep in mind as well is you're still viewing something at 72 DPI when you're looking at it on any monitor. Mm. Whereas I've got these printed up to about A1 and the eyes, the texture in the fur, it's it, it feels like you could touch the print and feel it. Yeah, And that's off, you know, a 16 megapixel camera that, yes, it's probably been cropped slightly. So you're probably still only looking at maybe a 12 megapixel file. Mm. But again, once you're up at 300 DPI in a print, you know, all these people that are carrying on, oh, I'm, I use 50 megapixel cameras because I can crop. I'm like, I've got a, an image off an 8 megapixel camera that's been cropped. So there's probably only 5 mm. megapixel left in the file printed it you know a2 and it still looks fine yeah exactly. exactly so this is coming you know more to my point this lion's had a lot more fight over territory and you know that sort of those scars and things can happen just on a feeding incident so the females will pull down you know prey he'll come in and get first dibs on it he might have five females all swiping at his face but he'll still drag the carcass away and get first dibs but he'll come out with scars as a result yeah right so it's not even it may not even be a fight a, a competition it might just be just just, just day-to-day life <laughs> yeah i mean cubs have been killed their own cubs have been killed in in the lineup for food and that's just been you know they've swatted at another full-grown lion over food to get out of the way and a cubs there and had its back broken as a result but mm. you know they've got that much power you know a full full blown even if it weren't for the claws a full blown full speed hit of that paw which is the size of a dinner plate mm. that that connects with you that'll break your neck you'll you'll die from the impact alone so yeah, yeah. scary you know then there's some like this in the collection which is slightly different light i mean it was side lit so you know, mm. technically I might say it doesn't fit with the rest of them. It's close, but it's not perfect. I mean, I know I could edit this now with Lightroom and just bring a, a grad in from the left-hand side and fix that. But, yeah. um, you know, in the end, when I look at a final collection, I'll probably have a a grade that I'll run over everything just so there is some, some repetition as such as far as mood and tone, but it's just the character that will change. Yeah. Yeah. A few... Um few great comments coming in here from grant grant's one of the the hosts the co-hosts we have on like a weekly live show where we just talk about photography and stuff and he's uh commenting because on the weekend i did go into a leica store and i did (laughs) happen to fall in love with a a a leica q2 so says me i want a leica yeah yeah i i I understand i'm full of contradictions grant (laughs) we'd Um, we'd all like we'd all like a leica i mean i know um, a very close friend of mine who was up until a few years ago one of the Canon masters, Crystal Wright. Crystal's uh, an ambassador now and endorsed with Leica. So yeah. yeah, and I'm sure doing great things with them. So oh, always. So sorry, Grant. I am going to get one one day. Uh, Grant also <laughs> says his wife Eilish gets angry when he tries to grab her food. Um, so it's not just lines that have to go through this sort yeah. of stuff. Well, it's when yeah, <laughs> just, as long as she doesn't slice your face open with the with the steak knife and you know. That's what these guys are dealing with, a, a, a fistful of steak knives to the face. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this is the father of the one that copped the horn through the face. So when you get to him, you'll you'll know. <laughs> you'll know. I think that might be the next one maybe. Yeah. 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 Insane. So it's, yeah. What we think's happened, it's either gored straight through the front or it's gone through the mouth and up the front of the face. But I've seen photos of him. So this was November last year. 
um, that it happened. And I saw some photos of him only about a month ago and it's completely healed over. And normally, it really? the, yeah, normally the scar tissue, you just get black, shiny skin, but the fur is growing back over as well. So you can hardly tell that he's got it. Yeah. Yeah. That, that wound is, is crazy. But, but then still... you could see as he was breathing, you could see like flaps of skin moving in and out, pus rolling out of it. It was completely open. His whole nasal cavity was literally air blowing in and out of it. So Man. yeah pretty full on and as soon as i saw him it was just sit there i have to he has to be in this collection i gotta get it i've gotta get it there's literally only two frames that suit out of hundreds really how long did you have to wait to uh to get that shot we're on the side and we're running out of light as well we're probably sitting there for an hour and he kept sort of putting his head up just halfway he was lying down and panting he was you know clearly in some pain and trying to heal Mm. And then we thought, uh, we're losing light. And then they got up and started walking. So they were actually about 200 metres away from an elephant carcass. So there had been an elephant that had died of natural causes. And they'd been protecting that carcass for about four or five days. And it reeked. It was absolutely mm. horrific. Mm. And and there were hyenas everywhere. So these guys, every couple of hours, would get up and walk in and have a feed and chase all the hyenas off. But even though they were a good distance away from it, the hyenas didn't dare come near it. And then I remember the day they got off and left and just left the carcass. All these vultures, all of these hyenas just came in and polished it off. There was nothing left of it after that, but there wasn't much left on it anyway. But um, yeah, they guarded it for about four days. So we knew that they were going to be in that area for for every day. But um, when they're that full of food, they're not going to be active. And that was part of the problem. They're not going to put up their head if they've di- they're lying digesting food in the heat. So it was just lucky that afternoon it was cooling down, it was losing light, and they were up after two days of gorging that it was time for them to eat again. So it was just circumstances. But again, it was knowing behaviour and knowing when to target it and yeah, yeah. come up with come up with the goods. Yeah, man, so cool, so cool. It'll yeah, such a great series already. Oh, yeah, I love that one. Yeah. Such a great series. I can't wait to see how it develops. No, it's um, it's going to take some time to get the numbers up there, particularly, you know, it's changed for me now. When I was running the tours for Canon, I obviously was only doing one a year because that's all I could do because, you know, I couldn't govern where I went. The boss had a say in that. But now yeah. it's, you know, as long as people are booking trips, then I'd, I'll be running more of them a year. So that, that number will change. But I'll always go in early and leave late on tours just so i've got some days of shooting where you know my customers needs uh first and foremost when i'm I'm taking clients whereas you know i'll always have some days without without customers where i can really just be hell-bent on shooting my own work (laughs) um what's more expensive a tour to africa or a tour to antarctica Depends where you go. Like Antarctica is pretty much set price across the board because they're all competing Mm -hmm. on the same experience. The difference in the experience for Antarctica comes down to the ship you're on. So there's one like the Eclipse, uh, which is probably one of the most expensive ships. You'll probably be paying 30 or 40,000 US per person. But you've got a day spa, a gym, a helicopter, an underwater submarine, and it's the absolute pinnacle of an underwater experience. submarine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And In yeah, it's called, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that is like, you know, for the mega rich elite can afford that, but for the yeah. average person, you know, if you looked at part of me, Antarctica 21, which is a com- company we work with, they've got two ships. They've got the, uh, the Magdalene Explorer and the ocean Nova. So the ocean Nova is a smaller ship, which is an advantage because it gets into sheltered bays where the bigger ships can't get to which means your Zodiac trip between the ship and shore is closer. So if it is a choppy day, you don't have as much time to get soaked or whatnot before you hit land. And you can get into areas that the bigger ships can't get to. So it's actually an advantage to be on a smaller ship. So, you know, the bigger ships are more stable, but if you're flying in and you're not doing the Drake Passage, then there's really no advantage to it otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Whereas, so Uh, Africa, like the the two, like... How many trips a year? Are you just running one trip a year to Africa? Or- uh, look, some some trips. So this year I've got four back-to-back trips in November oh, alone. Okay. Yeah. So, right. um, and are they but- are they all the same format? Those those back-to-back trips, or are they different itineraries for different experiences? So it's actually all- two different trips into the Okavango Delta with different itineraries. 
So okay. it's the same same length. And then there's a pre-trip on the first one, which is an extension. So everyone that's booked had the option of booking an extra four-night extension to a different location. Mm-hmm. So it's basically fly in. There'll be four nights at Mashatu Euphorbia, their new high-end lodge at this location here. Mm-hmm. Then from there, fly into the Okavango Delta for 10 nights. So it'll be three nights at one lodge, four nights at one lodge, and then three nights at another, and then fly wow. back. Then trip two, I'll already be in the Delta. So the new guests will arrive. We'll do 10 nights at three different camps to the first itinerary. So I'll be, you know, 20 days in the Okavango between six different lodges. And then that trip will end with an extension to a a different location for another four nights at the end as well. Right. And so ballpark, a trip like that with an extension how much is that costing someone roughly? Like- so look, the Okavango, as you know, earlier we were talking, is probably the most exclusive, expensive place that you can spend some money on in Africa. So you're looking at around, mm-hmm. it's about eighteen, nineteen thousand. Okay, so it's but, still it's 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 more expensive than Antarctica, but not by not by a not long by shot. much. No, well, so you're talking in, similar premium experiences. Yeah. Well, similar in price because the prices you're seeing for Antarctica, you've got to keep in mind are in US dollars. Yes, correct. Exactly. Actually, that's a good point. So by the time you convert it, then yeah, it's um, roughly the same. But if you weren't looking at high end, I mean, I'd I'd probably average for say a 10 day trip to Mashatu and then into say the Sabi Sands or the Timbavati in South Africa. If you did a five and four night trip, then Mm -hmm. you'd probably look at on average, about nine and a half grand, give or take, would be okay. the average for a very good trip. Yeah, for a good trip, and then all you've got to look at is your flights, um, flights in and out, and just sort of general. Yeah, yeah, getting around and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, between the two, if you had to decide, um, very different experiences, but mm-hmm. on cost alone, Africa would probably come in a little bit cheaper for the fact that return flights to Johannesburg are usually around sixteen hundred bucks, and it's yep. one flight. You're there, and then. It's either road transfer or a chartered flight into the location. Whereas to get to Antarctica, I mean, it's a, a flight from, say, Sydney to Santiago, Santiago to Punta Arenas. So you're mm-hmm. probably up, even economy, you're probably up around three and a half grand in comparison yeah. to 1600 return for South Africa. So flights alone and getting there is what will add to the cost. But once you're there, there is no other cost involved. All of your food, drinks, activities, everything's included. Yeah. And, you know, people often balk at the price of photographic tours for wildlife. But if you Mm. think about going to, say, Europe for two weeks, by the time you paid entry to museums and you stood in line for an hour, by the time you paid for dinners every night, lunches every night, you're probably spending five or $600 a day on accommodation in Europe or the US. Yeah. And then by the time you put in spending money and, you know, you're easily spending, if you're on a really tight budget, probably $500 a day anyway. Mm. Whereas you look at Safari, you're getting two, three or four hour game drives a day, plus all your meals. And a lot of them do include your drinks as well. But even if you're paying for alcoholic drinks, it's cheap as. I mean, I've been on trips where you've been away for two weeks and the bar tab at the end is 50 bucks. Ah, so, right. so they're not, it's not like they're like, oh, they're here for a Safari. Nah, Let's make the, the beers $15. Nah. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, that's good. Yeah. It's not, it's not Fiji. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. That's very interesting. It's um, yeah. As I mean, like they're massive investments, especially if you're taking more than one person, and they are a trip of a lifetime kind of things. But you know, we spend so much money on gear. It's like how long? How long can you put this stuff off? And how, and when do you have to sort of make it a priority? If if it can be, you know, unfortunately, Antarctica for me isn't a, a possibility yet. But you know, it's tax deductible for you. Oh, that look, yes, <laughs> yeah, but you got to have the money to pay <laughs> to be able to, to be able to claim it on tax. But you know, it's uh, it's a dream, um, yeah. and you've got to sort of try and make these things happen because, yeah, looking at other people's photos doesn't it make gets me excited, but it doesn't stop me from wanting to go there. It makes me more. Well, that's excited I mean, to go there. you hit the nail on the head. It started as a dream for me, and now I do it mm-hmm. for work. So. You know, it's yeah. not impossible, but in saying that, there are a lot of people entering the market that are doing it for the wrong reason. They're doing it because they want to go, 
not because they want to give clients an experience of a lifetime. So yeah, you know, those people won't last long in the industry, but you know, people come and go, but you'll definitely see the guys and girls out there that do it well are still in the industry for a reason. It's literally comes down to not only choosing the right locations at the right time, but it's ensuring that when you get your customers there, that you're looking after them and ensuring that they're the priority. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, for, for people like me that maybe it's not, it's not a possibility next. Well, yeah, no, it's not a possibility next year to go to Antarctica, um, but hopefully it is in the future. But in the meantime, what um, what options do you guys have for more local stuff yep. that's that's in a more budget friendly price range? So all our trips through Kakadu, uh, you'll see some of the website this thephotographyworkshopco.com. We've got. Australian local tours as well as international. So I leave in June for our trip up through Kakadu. Mm. And that one, it spans across landscape, cultural sites and experiences as well as wildlife. So we've got privately chartered cruises. And I don't know if you've ever been into Kakadu to Yellow Waters before. Um, Yellow Waters doesn't ring a bell. I have been to Kakadu. Yeah. So Yellow Waters is a place in Kawinda. So you know where the Crocodile Hotel is? Yeah. Yeah, and you go on the cruise around. Yep. It's like a big floating pontoon with 50 people sitting in seats that you can't get up and move on. <laughs> mm, <I've>, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the – if you pay as a tourist to turn up there, that's the experience because it's all governed by the lodge. Private boats can't go on the waterways there. So the only way you're going to do a cruise there is that way. Mm-hmm. We have a maximum of 14 customers on our on our trips and we charter that whole boat for our group only. Ah, uh, right. Okay. So, you know, we, we pay for every empty seat in order to have 14 customers with an extra hour. So we're out on the water for three hours and we stop and start and go where we want. And it's not just, you know, the tourist cruise is the guy has the microphone on. He talks yeah. to you about the, you know, the history. And, you know, while our guide can still give us that information, our priority is we're all on here for pictures. So, okay. you know, there's that. And then there's other billabongs that we've got private boats that we take out and um, get the access that way. So the difference in what we provide is very different to just blowing up to Darwin, getting out to Kakadu and jumping on a tour. It's highly prioritised to ensure that we're getting the best access and the best ability to shoot without any other customers. But not only that, we actually stay in some private uh, Aboriginal-owned camps so these accommodations, there's a place where there's a big escarpment that at sunset you've got two or 300 people clamber up at the top of it and sit there for sunset. Looking out from that view, it's a place called Ubir. Looking out at that view is where we're actually staying. So all the people on the hill looking, we're actually mm-hmm. out there with no one else. We actually stay in these private areas. So there's no other mm-hmm. tourists for, for the three nights that we're in there. And that is we've got our own billabongs, our own vehicles out there, all the landscape stuff, all the astro stuff. I was going to say Aboriginal, yeah. dark skies, big wide yeah. open horizons. Astrophotography yeah. would be a dream. Yep. Yeah. And there's some of the traditional rock art sites that is on private land that tourists can't go to, that we've got permission from the elders that are allowing us to stay on the property. They've yeah. got absolute full blessings for us to go into these areas and photograph some stuff that not everyone gets to see. Yeah. 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 It's, and is that just um, relationships from from years of, of doing this kind of stuff? Like how do you how do you build that? those experiences and, and get those that access for me it's partnerships so mm. relationships with suppliers so i actually work with uh luke and sarah from nt bird specialists so they've actually won multiple awards as tour operator of the year um up there and he's highly respected luke as a, a guide he's worked in the industry since you know driving buses for aat king and in, in the nt for probably the last 20 plus years and his uh, wife, Sarah, works for Park NT as well. So oh, okay. she already has a lot of working relationships with elders and whatnot. So it's not – her relationship with the elders is formed separate to that. So there's no conflict of interest as far as – there's no special access given. It's just yep. the fact that she does things the right way and by the book, which gets mutual respect from elders as well. Whereas – you'll find there is a lot of tour operators that are just me, 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 my customers, I want, I want, I want. And you're not going to bend the rules. If you've been told no, 
you've been told no. So yeah. as soon as there's that level of respect that's gone and it's clear that you're not in there for that reason, the doors start to close very, very quickly on getting access to some of this stuff. So for me, it's always partnering with the right suppliers that hold those relationships. And that's basically the reason why we get what we get. Yeah, nice. So working with people that do things the right way. Yeah, and it's the same as I developed. Um, so Lake Air is the other thing that I specialize in over the last eight years is yeah. aerial photographic trips to Lake Air. So we're actually hanging out of open door aircraft, taking pictures of, of landscapes. And that one I started um, speaking with the owner of William Creek Hotel, which is the closest area to Lake Air physically, who also owns an aviation company. And we charter these aircraft and take customers up for two hour flights at a time with the door open, taking pictures of landscapes. So, you know, there's still to date myself and two others. We actually took uh, Chrissy Goldrick, who's the editor in chief from Australia Geographic out there uh, a couple of years uh -huh. ago for a trip. And there was an article that we, we had done on, on Lake air and also the painted Hills out there. And we stayed out overnight in the Hills here. And we are still the only three people, me and old colleague and Chrissy um, that have stayed out there overnight. I've never been as cold in my life. I was colder oh. out there than I was in Antarctica because I wasn't wearing the right clothes. Were but, you ca um, camping or like what 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 did you have? I had a yoga mat and a sleeping bag. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. we just chucked it all in the back of the plane and it was just a, an idea. And, you know, to date, no one else has done it. There is a product <laughs> that we're working on, you know, to have swags and a bunch of stuff out there as a product in, in years to come. But yeah. there is, yeah, still to date, there's no one else with Astro Shots out there at this location and it's it looks like you know mars or the closest thing i could probably compare it to would be maybe utah so you've got those okay. big sort of pin, pin, oh, the pinnacles of rock and, and whatnot yep. out there but yeah and when we take our groups out there we can walk around you know we've i've done so many trips out there as that the owner of the the property and whatnot you can't get out there as a tourist on your own you can't drive out there you can only be flown into the airstrip and flown back out it's, it's actually on a cattle station Anna Creek Station, which is the largest cattle station in the world. But um, with that land and the permission yeah. that we have, tourists can take a 45-minute walk out there. So it's about a 25-minute flight to get out there from William Creek Hotel and then 25 minutes back. So you're essentially paying for an hour's airtime. So you're probably you know, six or $700 to go for a 45-minute walk out there. Mm. But there's no other way you're going to get in there. And they have to stick to a path that the pilot takes them on, yeah. whereas we – go out there for four hours we climb to the top of hills we go wherever the hell we want so and that's yeah. that's again because there's a relationship there and they know that you you guys aren't going to do the wrong thing essentially correct um, yeah. and and we pioneered it i mean I, I literally had that product for nearly two years before i had a competitor in the market and i think there's probably four fairly well-known competitors offering similar trips now at varying price points but you know i'll yeah. still put hand on heart to say that we did it first so <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's stunning. The landscapes are just... So yeah. that spot there, from where the airstrip is, is about an hour and a half on foot to get out there. And we, I did it in the dark. I literally looked at my swag, took a screen copy of my compass on my iPhone. <laughs> I turned around, I looked at the pinnacle and took a screen copy of my compass. And then every 10, 10 minutes or so as I was walking in the pitch dark, I was just turning it on to make sure I was still walking in the right direction and we got out there and back without getting lost. But if you get lost out there, the, the airstrip's not lit. If you had an injury out there overnight, there's no help until the next morning when the plane's coming to pick you up again. Oh, man. So that's why we don't have a product out there with customers yet, but um, we're working on plans, yeah. And this is what it's like uh, in the plane? Correct. So that door can open and close in the air if you want to. So getting out to the lake, it's only about 20 minutes from, from William Creek. Then we spend two hours flying over before coming back. So quite often we'll just shut the door and you get faster airspeed to get yep. out there and then open the door because the windows, as much as you know, people in aviation companies say, oh, they're special glass so you can shoot through them, you get distortion. Hey, it yeah. softens your images and it pulls all the contrast out of your files. So the difference is night and day with it with it open. Yeah. Yeah, and you get reflections too, depending on the angle you're shooting through and all sorts of pain. Yeah, I've I've shot doors off on a on a chopper before, but never in a plane. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can imagine you get some some serious wind depending on the airspeed. Well, not really. I mean, the wind itself, it there's a little scoop which is on the side of the door frame. 
So you you literally have to stick your head out before you feel any resistance. So okay. like if your lens if your lens just creeps out a little bit, then you feel the drag. You'll feel it sort of drag back. But yeah. the good thing is, is the door position where you see the the lady holding the door open with the foot. We actually put a ratchet strap and just leave the door open the whole flight now. Yeah. But um, you'll generally find from that position, you'd have to sort of lean forward through a comfortable range on your seatbelt to to get outside. Whereas yeah. the secondary position on the inside, then you just sit sideways in the chair. And once you lean forward, you can get your lens to the edge. So yes. it's uninterrupted. The size of the door, it's, I mean, they call it an air van, a Gippsland air van. So it is a very wide door. So I generally find the tail seat, you get a bit of an advantage because you can see what's coming up yes. ahead versus the indoors. So the way we do it is we just rotate the customers through. So in the morning flight, those two will go up in the same plane again in the afternoon and swap. Swap seats. Yeah. And then we've always got the the possibility, say flight one, the customer gets up there and over the radio says, I'm really nervous. This is not comfortable. Shut mm -hmm. the door, swap seats, open the door again, keep going. Yeah. So you've always got, that's why I use the air van. Whereas the Cessnas, if you go up in like the 206s, You've got to remove the door. So from takeoff, you can't take your seatbelt off. You're in. You're strapped yes. in until you get out of the plane again. Yeah. Whereas, yeah, the air vans, I'll always use them. They're not as fast, but they're more stable. So you'll yep. find if you're getting any turbulence and whatnot, they're actually a lot more stable than the Cessnas. Yeah, Do doors off the whole time would be. I mean, it was. I was I was nervous in the chopper. You know, like mm. you, you're strapped in, but. Um, seat belts they're not like harnesses they're they're no. just little seat belts and and yeah it rolls over and stuff like that so it's like yeah once 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 you take off you're not doing a lot of moving um until you land again no. so being able I mean, to close that door would be nice it is i mean the difference too is you don't get the buffeting you don't get the downdraft off the rotors like you're doing choppers yeah so with this it, physically i find it's a lot smoother out of the aircraft and we only do these in winter if you go up there, I mean, you'd be a sucker for punishment if you if you go up there outside of winter because yeah. the thermals, it'd be like flying over a mirror, essentially. It's just, you're going to hit pockets of, of turbulence. It's going to, I have flown up there outside of winter and I can honestly say I wouldn't sign anyone up to do it. So my season, I always do them between May and August. Yeah. Um, I generally find, I mean, that's when most of the time the water is going to come in anyway, but as it starts to dry is where you start getting the better color anyway. So everyone wants to see Lake Air full, but if it's just filled, it's like, you may as well just take a photo at the top of your cup of coffee. It's just going to be brown and murky. Yeah. Whereas as it dries up, that's where all the algal blooms will start as well. And as soon as you get stagnant water is where you get color. Yeah. Yeah. And that's when you get those, those beautiful colors. Yeah, and it's just silt, sand, and salt essentially, and then algae as well. Let's see if I can find. There was a couple of other photos at the start of this gallery that were just. Uh... Yeah, there's one that looks like a human torso. Yeah, that one it looks like I call it fit Homer Simpson. It looks like a, a cross section of Homer Simpson's anatomy. <laughs> it has these abs. <laughs> you can see abs here. Yeah, that's how I, that's how I've always seen it. That was on my first trip up there. So, yeah, the first trip I took up there, I was up with tourism south australia so there was a guy i was dealing with um that put me on to the owner of william creek hotel and and rights air that owned the aircraft and i was flown up there on behalf of tourism sa and we basically went into flinders ranges and looked around Wilpena. and for me i wanted to create a tour that did flinders ranges with lake air yeah but with the amount of airtime just to get between flinders ranges and lake air was it was just putting the price point too high so I just decided the hero here is Lake Air. So let's just do a Lake Air trip and stay at William Creek and, and just you're within a 20-minute flight every time yeah. you get out to the lake. So, you know, we I just went out there for about three hours, went out for lunch to meet with the owner. They took me on a flight for an hour around the southern end of Lake Air North. And still to date, this is my image to beat. And that was just, you know, the first hour ever doing it. So that's that's my elephants behind me for Lake Air. That's the one to beat. <laughs> I love how you've got an image to beat for uh, for each location. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Keeps you, keeps you hungry going back. It's, well, you just um, see, I mean, the, the great thing with Lake Air is wind governs where the water is, not tides, because it's an inland lake. And as it fills, it's so shallow that as soon as there's wind, it blows it across to the other side within, a, 
you know, within even one day. Yep. So we've flown over areas in the morning where we've gone back up in the afternoon and it's shifted and all the silts in a different location and it looks completely different to six hours earlier. Wow. That fast. So, yeah. So if you're going up there running, like I've had trips, you know, each month, probably four, four trips in one year where I've gone up in late April, mid May, late May, early June, then late August as an example. And mm -hmm. every trip is entirely different. Yeah. And, you know, I've got customers. There's one of my um, regular customers down here, Heather um, from Melbourne. She's been with me on this trip, I think, five times now. Oh, wow. Really? And every time gets something different. There's never a, a trip where it's like, oh, it kind of wasn't as good as last year. You know, it's, it's yeah. never a case of if it's as good. It's just it's different. You get different, different. color, different patterns. Yeah. Yeah, it just it looks it it looks like a abstract art, you know. Yeah, it's like yeah, crazy. Yeah, and you get what? stuff like this. It looks like some alien, but that's actually a mound spring. So it's an underground spring that pushes water up. So all of the sand and sediment underground pours up from the center of the the mineral springs, and then where the water starts to leach off, you'll see it sometimes turns blood red. I mean, you've got some shots mm -hmm. where you've got these like blue and red and it's just algae and salt essentially yeah oh here we go that one looks like to me it looks like a heart like you've got the the valves yeah. at the top and to me that's always reminded me of a heart that blue is wild yeah yeah so cool so cool but it is, um, you know, it's the sort of thing that it came to me from, I was actually flying from Darwin back to Melbourne after doing a trip to Kakadu. And I remember flying over Lake Air and seeing it from, you know, a Qantas jet and going, I wonder what that looks like closer to the ground. So as soon as I got home, I opened Google Maps. I didn't know much about Lake Air or anything. I just opened Google Maps and my job at Canon with Canon Collective was to create unique experiences for our customers Yep. which led me to speak to SA Tourism, which led me going on a recce and producing the trips that I produced. But I just remember thinking, I wonder what it's like. So up comes Google Maps. I'm scrolling around. Next minute I see William Creek. I see it has an airstrip. I look up the website. I see they also have an aviation company who's the same guy that owns the hotel, which is the only place that you can stay at out there. And a couple of phone calls later, within three months of negotiations and backwards and forwards, I'm on a plane up there and I'm bolting a trip together. So, yeah. Yeah, it's that quick. But so yeah. so that just came from flying over at, at, at 30,000 feet. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Yep. And on average, so the shots you would have seen most of the time, I'm between 500 and 1,500 feet yeah. most of the time. Yeah. So you can go higher. So when you get much bigger areas and, you know, we get up to maybe 7,000 feet in some, some cases, yeah. there's a spot out there we call the brain and it looks like a brain. It's this big green um, patch of – it's a big marsh essentially, a big boggy marsh. And the earth is really hard red rock. And where the water wells up, all the grass grows and it squiggles around and it literally looks like a brain with a spinal cord on it. Oh, so for wow. that one, we'll, you know, we'll go up maybe 5,000 feet just so if you, if you lower to the ground perspective warps, it doesn't look circular. It looks elongated. So to keep that perspective round, you've got to get hot. So we just communicate with the pilots if we want more altitude or less altitude. So I generally find, and again, with gear, you know, coming back to gear for aerial work, different mm. locations, I'll use different lenses if you had to guess what the best lens is for those photos, what would you say I was using? 24 to 105. That's what everyone says. Damn it. One, 100, <laughs> 100 to 400. Really? 400, I'm 300 to 400 mil most of the time. I'd say 90% okay. of the shots. And that's even at 500 feet. Yeah. So I find if you're too wide, every, everything's too far away and small and you kind of miss yeah. everything. Like yeah. you fit it all in, but you're looking at fine patterns and details rather than something big and in your face. Yeah. I do shoot a second body with a wider lens on it, but I'll look at my Lightroom catalogs and it literally 90% every trip is 100 to 400 and mm. 300 mil onwards is part of that reason is because I'm in the forward seat shooting backwards through the door. So mm. I'm very, I'm very late on everything because the customers have got the priority seats. Yeah. 
Whereas the seats the customers are in, you can probably shoot a bit wider because you're on top of it, not shooting back on it. Yep. So I'm, I'm, you know, half a kilometre shooting the same thing that they were shooting two minutes ago because it's right out the back door from where I'm sitting. Otherwise, I've got to shoot through two layers of glass because I've got a window, then the door's open with another window. Yes. So if I was I, to shoot out the window, I get nothing. So it's a case, I, again, I'll... In the, I'll go in up the with photo yeah. with with the plane, though, I did notice that it looked like I think they both had one hundred four hundreds maybe on as well. So it looked like even even yeah. in those seats, they were um, preferring to get in tighter on things as well. Yeah. So yeah. hundred mil is fairly wide. I mean, you fit pretty much if you see a big, colourful patch on the ground, yeah. it'll all fit in at a hundred mil. But then when you start picking off the little details that make up structure and all of the abstract colour and whatnot. You know, it can be runoff from a dried creek bed or an inlet and it looks like, you know, tree roots, that type of thing. Yeah. You know, you might pick off that and just shoot it looking like a tree at 400 mil, whereas you pull back, you get the whole picture at 100. Yeah. So there's really not a great deal of use for a, a wider angle lens up there. Yeah. Yeah, okay. But for that one, I mean, those tuned in and listening, if you're interested in those trips, it's just lakeairfromtheair.com. So Lake, Lake Air, Air is... Air. Yeah, so Lake Air is not as in A-I-R, it's E-Y-R-E. Yeah, whereas yeah. a lot of the other tours, uh, the Antarctica tour particularly, that could be found on the Photography Workshop Co. website. If you just Google yeah. the Photography Workshop Co. Um, yeah, definitely. And, and then there's a heap of other experiences on there too. I saw, were you running a, um, just a local, um, was it a Birds of Prey workshop? Yep. Um, yeah, so that's... Over the weekend? Yeah, that was just a normal, just wild birds. And I've got one coming up in Hillsville Sanctuary, which obviously are captive birds, but it's more about training and getting in with guaranteed sightings. Whereas the wild mm -hmm. birds, it's, it's luck of the draw, which I just did on yep. the weekend. Um, and unfortunately, we had really foggy weather. So we got unusual pictures, which are hard to get, you know, ducks on complete fogs. So you got these really weird, high key, misty, haunting shots, which I actually really liked. It was pretty cool. But then the Birds of Prey workshops, again, it's partnering with the owner who has the largest private collection of Australian Birds of Prey in Australia on a, on a property up near Ballarat. So that's at the end of this month. And we've got three hours of these birds being flown directly into your lens. So it's the, really the only sort of place in Australia where you can get that experience. And um, he does that exclusively with me. So it's um, a cool workshop as well. Very cool. Mm. Very cool. Yeah. And it's those kind of things that it's like, You've just got to make time to go and do them and, and a workshop. So, yeah, I've, I've done a lot of workshops over the years, um, whether it's for, you know, when I was a, a wedding photographer, I would make sure to try and get to as many as I could. It was always hard because you'd look at the price and you'd be like, I could buy a new lens or I could go to this workshop. And then, you know, you finally get someone who talks you into making the right decision and going to the workshop because yeah. a, new, a new lens doesn't do, you know, unless you're at the point where you're still trying to put together just a basic camera kit, a new lens won't do for you what a workshop will do. Yeah. Um, you know. And the thing is, like workshops, if it's development into something that is becoming work and you get a return on it. So, I mean, being a wildlife photographer, there's a lot of outlay. Mm. and not a lot of return on investment. So, mm. you know, working to try and make money doing it, it's not as easy. But, you know, that image was sold to American Express Travel one year for about seven grand for a one-off promotion they were doing for like their, I think it was a travel insurance ad um, in the US. Um, so I think it was like three months just for a mail, a mail distribution, you know, header on, on their paperwork for three months. Yep. Um, I've got some stuff coming up actually with a lot of Australian content, um, which was about a thirteen, fifteen thousand dollar sale selling mm -hmm. images. So look, it does come. And then, you know, for me, obviously my business is paying clients and taking them on these experiences. But, you know, for me, I'd rather develop workshops that is worth the money. You know, there are a lot yes. of people out there that will run photographic education and photographic workshops and you know, you jump online at any given time and Eventbrite and there's 200 different people offering a photo walk in Melbourne CBD. And yeah, I, I don't jump in and compete with that market because there's 200 other people that do it and I'm not interested in doing what everyone else is doing. So yeah, I really, you know, would rather produce something that not everybody does, not everybody can do. And again, it's forming those partnerships that ensures that it's exclusive and it's worth every dollar of, of admission. So yeah. Mm. Very cool. 
I'm uh, I'm keen as I'll be jumping onto one. I just don't know what yet. Um, and then yeah, setting my sights on Antarctica. I don't know when. <laughs> Sometime. <laughs> well, so Africa pretty- and Antarctica. I mean, both of them. The best time to go is ASAP because they go up in price every year. Yeah. yeah so it inherently point. will happen. And you'll find all of the lodges basically three to five percent most years. Is you, you'll look at this season versus next season's pricing. And you're probably looking at about 125 US a night more yep. every night. So every year, it just keeps getting more and more expensive. Yeah. How early do your, your Africa tours for this year already all booked out? Look, it's hard. This year's ones were all sold out without advertising. And that was because yeah. they were last year's customers. We were all sitting around the campfire last year, just joking about, oh, where are we going next year? And all of these customers were seasoned veterans in Africa. Some were first timers, but a majority of them were repeat customers. So they've they've kind of done the locations that everyone wants to do, and they want now to get into a location that not everybody gets to do. You know, it certainly wouldn't be the first pick for some people. Either it's too exotic and far out, or it's not going to give me the postcard locations that I want to see classic Africa. So yeah. the Okavango is crown of the jewel it's it's you would aspire to it and you've got to have the means and, and the money to get there unfortunately what we discussed earlier so yeah everyone had done the migration before in kenya they've done the sabi sands in south africa so i said to them look let's do you want to go to the okavango delta and they've gone yeah i've always dreamed of it and it's time to do it so we, we just sold it out straight away so didn't That's have awesome. to advertise that one but look just with the way the economy is things aren't filling as quickly um, Antarctica mm-hmm. certainly last year we sort of got the numbers a bit quicker and people are probably watching the budget and you know those yeah, paying true. a mortgage that are now having to scrape up 1500 bucks extra a month just to pay for you know their mortgage and then put food on the table so I get it it's, it's a tough one but look there's always a market in what I do for high-end experiences and it's it's lucky for me in a case that usually people that have money can afford it um you know, a lot of the time you'll have, oh, I, you'd love to do a trip with you, but your trips are too expensive. There's a lot of competitors in the market that do offer the lower end stuff, but the experience is, is very different as a result as well. So yeah. I tend to find I'm happy with filling the amount of tours I do a year without having to be away for six months of the year. So I'd much rather know that I'm doing something at, you know, at the top of the game with the best possible sightings, with the best possible team than yeah. to do something half-baked in order to make money off customers and you're not providing them with the best experience, I personally wouldn't do it. I couldn't do it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's better, you know, knowing that you can provide a great experience than, than trying to compete on price um, yep. and, and having to cut corners. You don't want to be doing that. Yeah. Um, yeah, very cool. I'd, uh, I actually had a heap, a heap of other things I wanted to dig into, but it's already been three hours, which is crazy. Yeah. Oh, it feels like um, thirty I'm, minutes. Yeah, I know. I'm I'm mindful of your your time and your day because I yeah I want to talk about. I, maybe we might have to do a part two one day because I want to talk about your your concert photography. I want to talk about uh, the series of portraits. Um, ah, I don't know. I think we might have to. What do you reckon? We do a part two right. one day. Oh, it's up to you. I've got nowhere to be. I don't know if you need to be anywhere, but. <sighs> I don't, I don't have nowhere to be, but I just, well, let's, let's have a quick look at some concert photography. Cause it's been, sure. yeah, it's been catching my eye. So you, this was one of the first things you started doing. Yeah. So I was actually shooting. So when I left school, I left before my final exams in year 12, because I wasn't doing the subjects I wanted to do and music. I was, you know, a musician anyway. And I wanted to, I was obsessed with shooting music. So 98 was the first music festival. I had a triple A pass to shoot the Vans Warped Tour. And oh, uh, yeah. at that time, I think it was um, trying to remember who played that year. I know it was Suicidal Tendencies, Deftones, um, yep. Pennywise, a few others. So, you know, I went and shot that music festival. Before that, it was just mates bands and smaller bands and, you know, ended up working for a bunch of different publications over the years and, and shooting music. But I actually left high school to do a two-year course in music industry and business and, um, you yeah, know, ended up working with a whole bunch of different publications. But, you know, doing work directly with bands. So, I mean, this is a band from the States, uh, the Dillinger Escape Plan, who, you know, yep. top three band for me. I actually flew to New flew to New York in 2017 to see their last three shows ever because they called it a day, and I was literally two days out of hospital from having kidney stones, and 
I still went and pretty much pissed blood for five days and was in agony to go. But, really? Um, and yeah, just yeah. just to watch or did you shoot those shows as well? Or Just to watch. I mean, I've been in contact with Ben, this guy here, the guitarist, and um, I just said, look, I'm not in a good way. Is there any chance you just get me a media pass and, you know, I'll shoot and whatnot. And he said, look, I'm turning back global media on this. It's already full. The VIP section's full. He's like, I can put you in the disabled section if you want. I'm like, nah, I'm not going to stand at the back of the crowd. I need to be amongst it. But, you know, probably against the health advice of doctors i went in anyway and did it but yeah no <laughs> no, no regrets it was awesome oh, that's but, unreal yeah i mean i worked with dillinger a couple of times when they came over a good friend of mine uh chris marrick was one of their pr managers uh, in australia for a bunch of record labels he did all the pr for relapse which was their their record label at the time and that opened up a lot of doors as well it's, it's who you know not what you know in the music industry big time because there's yeah there's a hundred kids behind you wanting to do what you do and there's less and less publications now and there's just no money. And that's why I stopped shooting music. There's, you know, well, no that's, money. That's and a, yeah. So to get access in the first place, um, what did you have to do to, to, so to you, get your foot in the door? Were you working for a publication that, that got you access? No. So Vans Warped was the first one that I did that was a major, major thing. And, out of that, I would have only been 18, 19, possibly, 98. Yeah. I'm not great with maths, but I'm 44 this year and <laughs> do the numbers. But um, I wrote a letter to them. This is before email was a thing. <laughs> and just said, you know, I want to do this as a career. And I was lucky enough back in the day when I was working at Nikon, I worked with a guy called Andrew King. And his dad was Bob King, who, industry legend, you'd put him in you know, the top music photographers in the world. There was him and Tony Mott both here in Australia and they highly influenced me. And, you know, I worked with his son and Nick on professional services, Bob would come in and I'd look after Bob with camera gear and I was stoked. It was a bit, you know, starstruck in a way. Yeah. And, you know, Bob's been ACDC's touring photographer. He's been Rolling Stones touring photographer. He's shot the Beatles. He's shot Elvis. He's, he's done it all. Right. So, to get to that level, the industry was very different back then. And I know for me, when I started doing it, there were a ton of publications. And then that got even bigger when the internet started because you had online and print. Then print media took a nosedive. And before you knew it, there were very little publications. So a lot of big bands like Kiss, as an example, wouldn't allow any, no agencies because agencies will sell those images to whichever magazine wants to run a story. Yeah. And that might end up in a publication that KISS don't want represented. Say, you know, adult magazines, Playboy might do a, an article on rock music and Gene Simmons, of all people, probably belongs in that type of magazine anyway, might be <laughs> against it. Uh, you know, just as an example, that's where yeah. they wouldn't allow agencies. Metallica was the same thing. They wanted to control where the images would end up. So you'd have yeah. to apply through the publication for a credit. You needed accreditation. So yeah. the PR manager would basically open up and take in all the requests and then they'd sit back and look at the requests and know the magazines, know the reputation of the magazines. They'd supply feedback back to management of the band or the band would have very specific set of regulations that they don't want to appear in these magazines. So if accreditation pass request comes through, that gets to client. So bigger yeah. music festivals are hard because you've got different wishes off different bands. So I know from shooting, say, Soundwave and Big Day Out and stuff like that, you'd have some bands that wouldn't allow agencies and some that would. So they'd have to check your accreditation pass. So I know like Iron Maiden were very, very particular on what photographers could shoot. You, uh, Ozzy Osbourne, Black Sabbath, yeah. um, he didn't care less. You do what you want. <laughs> Just but, um, yeah, D didn't give a shit. I uh, probably had no idea you were there anyway. <laughs> <laughs> But in a way, I mean, I remember going into this show thinking, oh, God, this is going to be like watching a, a road crash. You know, I'm a metal fan. And, you know, Black Sabbath started metal, right? So yeah. I just thought, oh, God, this is going to be like watching a road crash. And he's a different person on stage. Mm. He just gives it on. You just know he walks off stage and goes straight to bed because he's absolutely knackered. But, yeah, yeah it was surprisingly better and then like kiss too i personally i can't stand their music but yeah. live one of the most amazing bands to shoot because as soon as they saw you move into a position and hold a camera up 
they play to you for a second before they give it back to the crowd. Whereas yeah. every other band couldn't care less. They don't give you a, th a thing. Whereas these guys are a marketing machine. They want every photo that's hitting the media to look like that. Yeah, well, that, they, that photo looks like a um, if you were like, all right, we need to um, design a poster for an upcoming tour. So let's get um, lighting in and let's get everything designed and set up for the photographer so that we can yeah. just do this stylized shot. That's what this looks like. It, lo yeah. it looks like it was set up, you know. That's the thing, but the only guys selling those posters are Kiss and that's where they're making their money. You should it's... see the clause, the contract that you have to sign before you get your accreditation for these guys. Oh, I bet. Did you have to just hand your, ca hand your camera over at the end of the shoot and just and they oh, strip you down naked or something? Not far off, but <laughs> it was definitely... I mean, they didn't go as far as what you... The rule was the publication is the only place that can use the images you take for the agreed edition. So you can't resell yep. it into a different edition. So you're you're applying yeah. for this issue that's coming out this month. Yep. So and can then you, you can't go on and sell it. And you can use it for your own portfolio uh, to display. So say you could, you know, these days, could you post this on social media now and say, I shot this image? Could you, could you put it on your profile? Depends if it was deemed as commercial use. So ah, if you yes. were using it to promote your services as a business, then they'd probably wind up in court saying that you were using it commercially to attract business. So, uh, yeah. you know, in kind roundabouts, of. it's commercial usage. So yeah. technically that would be against the contract that you agree to. Whereas, yeah. you know, Taylor Swift and people like that and Iron Maiden as well, you had to send the images to their management for approval before you could even use them. Oh, so wow. they'll go back and say, of the 15 that you are hoping to run, you can only use image one and image three. You can't use the others. And that might just be because, you know, the funny look on their face or something that yeah. the artist didn't like about it. But, yeah, some of them. And, you know, this band, hardcore band from uh, Scandinavia, refused. Yep. Uh, all was backlit. was all backlit. There was literally not a lighting can at the front. So that was the Enmore Theatre in Sydney and, you know, so you can't – I would liken it to wildlife. You can't control what's going on. You can't control yeah. the light. You've just got to adapt. Yeah. Yeah. That's the coolest part. Yeah, and that's what I loved about it. I mean, you've got the best best seat in the house for three songs and then – so that was with, I think, it was either Terrorizer or Kerrang, one or the other in the UK that that yep. one ran. It was a six-page on the Australian tour. So that was not the last one they did, the one before that. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. What – um, Metallica. Man. Yeah. What a dream. That's probably one of the most memorable. I mean, I grew up obsessed with Metallica, not so much these days, but, um, you know, to shoot this was on their Death Magnetic tour, which had the in the round. So normally from a media pit, you're in between the stage and the crowd, right? You get first three songs, no flash, and then you get out. So with this particular tour, the stage mm -hmm. was low. So even when you were standing next to the stage, it came just above your hips. So oh, they were really, really close to you and you could walk all the way around the stage. So normally you'd only get lines based at the front of the stage to, to choose from. So you're either mm -hmm. standing in front of them or shooting across stage. With this, you could walk all the way around the stage. So you, you could pick yeah. angles. So I was particularly for this shot. When he came to that mic, I was lining the light up behind him, knowing that I'd get lens flare, shooting straight into it. So, yeah. you know, it's the only concert I've had where you could create the shots because you had unrestricted access as to where you could go. Yeah, yeah freedom of movement around. Mm. Yeah, that's so cool. But so did you have to stay crouched the whole time? Did you say if you stood up, you would be sort of at the, the stage would be a waist height? Yeah, probably just above hip height. So, yeah, yeah, we had first three. I mean, they opened on this song, this one, I think, with For Whom the Bell Tolls. So it was probably like eight and a half minute song. Yeah. Then, oh, I can't remember. Essentially, the first three songs equated to nearly half an hour. So I had a ton of time. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. Do you, uh, do you miss shooting music? I do. I do. You know, it's something I love to do. I mean, this, again, that, that last shot with Amal and the Sniffers, they opened for Smashing Pumpkins on their recent tour, which I shot only, it was probably, what, two or three weeks ago. And that's the first live show that I've done in, in years because I just haven't been chasing the work. I mean, there hasn't been the work anyway for, because of COVID. But, um, yeah, you know, it's the first big production show that I'd shot in a few years for the simple fact that I just gave up shooting it because, you know, there was a lot of kids competing for the access and no one paying. So commercially, it just made no sense to 
add to the problem. So I just bowed out. Yeah. Do you think um, actually there's a there's another a podcast called uh, Behind the Shot that I was listening to, and there was a guy on there who's the photographer for. This is going to sound bad, but I'm not really a country fan. What's that super famous country singer at the Neither moment? Neither am I. I know uh, who you're he, talking about, but yeah. The, he's a megastar. Um, yeah. It'll come to me. Anyway, he's his photographer, and he actually was able to organize with him to run workshops at his shows. Yeah. So, so the artist allowed um, his photographer to bring, I think, a group of four or five people to a show they beforehand yeah. they scope the stage out check out sound check and stuff like that and then they get to shoot a couple of songs yeah um which is to me sounds like like what an experience to be yeah. able to offer people you know like with access to it to a real yep. band um well, we actually cool. did that a few years ago with canon collective we did that because guy sebastian really? was one of the ambassadors so it was one of his shows with Guy Sebastian, I think Shannon Knoll, and then we did another thing with Tina Arena, and I'm trying to remember who the other one was, but it was the same deal. It was each show in each major city, we had you know 10, 10 access passes to shoot the first three with all the other media in the pit, and then when all the media kicked out, then they got an extra two songs. So they got more than what the media got. And that was again another initiative with Canon Collective, which you know doesn't exist anymore for the fact that they they closed it down. So it's a sad, sad thing. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, is is it something you'd ever consider trying to do, like a, a workshop experience um, in the music? Impossible. Sort of side of things too hard. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's just there's too many. I mean, unless the band was making money off it, why are they going to want to do it? Yeah. Um, you know, they might do it. I think Parkway Drive or. One of the others yep. possibly at some stage, I think might've done something for their like fans, that. but you know, for yeah. someone that's going to commercialize out of it, like, you know, for me to contact any, any band, they're just going to go. No. I think, I think the only way this guy was able to do it was he had a really good relationship with the artist um, yep. and said, here's what I want to do. And they were just like, yeah, cool. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, I don't care. Like, it, it, you know, sounds good as long as we, I think they sort of have some control over what can be done with the images. Um, and yep. I think they get to use the images if they want to, that kind of thing. Um, mm. But they, I can't, I'm trying to remember who it is. This, It's not Urban. Are you saying Keith Urban? It's not Keith Urban. No. Nah. <laughs> it's, um, oh, it's oh, on the tip oh. of my tongue. Someone in the chat, throw it in there. Super famous. <laughs> He's like a mega star at the moment. But anyway, I couldn't believe that he would, even, you know, you'd think when people get that big, they would just say, no, nah, I don't want any of that at my show. You know, like, I've got to focus on my show. Yeah. Um, like, you look, at, you look at some of the hardest contracts. I mean, literally Google Taylor Swift media contract or photography contract, and someone's yeah. taken a picture of it and posted it online. It's brutal. She pretty much says, you don't come in unless if I see a photo that I want, I get. Yeah. So you're That's signing right. away your copyright. Yeah. It's yeah. like if, if I come for it and you say no, I'll see you in court. Yeah. 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 And I actually pretty... photographed Taylor Swift before she was famous. So I've actually got pictures when most of the media didn't even pick up their lens. They couldn't care less. She was nobody at that time. Really? Uh, yeah. That was part of it was a festival called Sound Relief that was done for it was either the bushfires or floods years ago. Yeah. One or the other. And it's at the time when I think she was dating Zac Efron. And this is when um <laughs> twilight was really big so like this is like 15 more than 15 years ago and coldplay played at it um ice house barry gibb um umi a bunch of other australian stuff it was at sydney football stadium and i was there with a, another photographer that was really well known in the music industry which was um, david anderson and David, he, him and his team used to have the contract for the Arias and you know, anything that happened in Australian music, it was David Anderson, Bob King and Tony Mott. They were the, the top three. So on the day, covering this whole festival officially for the organisers was myself, David Anderson, Tony Mott was the head and then Bob mm -hmm. King was in there shooting for a bunch of different magazines. And, you know, that ended up on the DVD sleeves, covers, all the PR, all of it. And... Um, yeah, Taylor Swift was one of the first. I think Coldplay actually opened because they had a show that night that they had to oh, go yeah. to. So they opened and that ensured that there was a full capacity crowd at the start. And then I think Taylor Swift was on second and no one had heard of her. Like there were some kids screaming because she was Zac Efron's girlfriend and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, and do yeah, you think right. I can find the photos now? I couldn't tell you. Luke Coombs, uh, that's the Luke one. Luke Coombs, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jay Shang. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Luke Coombs. That is him. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, not right. So you've got. Not to be got... mixed up with Peter Coombs. You're about my pedigree when it comes <laughs> yeah. to age, the old Peter Coombs. <laughs> yep. The funniest thing is, yeah, uh, I reckon it was, it was probably 10 years ago. I went and saw Peter Coombs at the Enmore and it was this tour he did literally to get the Enmore full of people swilling beers, singing along to songs that I used to sing in kindergarten. So the whole room is full of like 35 to 50 year olds. Really? Literally getting on the piss watching Peter Coombs live at the Enmore. It was hilarious. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> that would be awesome. Yeah. Uh, it's... It's weird when we get older and all that stuff sort of, you know, and then similar kind of weird thing happened when the uh, cover, the Wiggles cover won uh, Triple J Hottest 100, mainly yeah. because, you know, it's, oh, I don't know, it's strange when you get old and, and your stuff circles around again. Oh, uh, it's the nostalgia and that's where so many bands are doing these comebacks and, yeah. you know, cashing yeah. in because you can make money. It used to charge, you know, $60 to see, a band 10 years ago that now is going to be a $300 ticket. Yeah. And it's just, you know, production costs. And yeah, I did have a lot to do with that side of the music industry and it's just changed. And, you know, bands used to make all their money off record sales and now it's touring. If you don't tour and you don't sell merch, you don't yeah. survive in the industry. Did you, did you ever shoot Parkway Drive? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Shot them. I actually, my old band toured with them in, in the earlier years before they were really known. We we opened for them in Bendigo when they uh, oh, right. when they came here. Yeah, before they were no, we actually brought them here. We we used to run run gigs when I was in a band like early twenties. We would um, run sort of gigs in Bendigo because otherwise we had nowhere to play. Yeah, um, what so band? Would, <laughs> I don't want to say. Our name we were called Blank Expression. We right. were not good, but we were yeah. not good. We had great fun, um, and yeah, we opened for them when we brought them to Bendigo. Um, which was that's that's my claim to fame. <laughs> yes, yeah. that yeah, they were they were sort of starting to get popular in the, you know, in the hardcore scene, but they were nowhere yeah. near like nowhere near where they are now. Like that's the thing, we were you know technical death metal in a way, so we we didn't okay. belong in a bill with a hardcore band, and we'd never played on lineups with a hardcore band. So yeah, I'd, I'd not experienced hardcore dancing. So I remember these oh. guys came on. I'm like, who's this Parkway Drive band? And there's these kids doing like spin kicks in the pit. And I'm like, what the yeah. hell is this? That was my first experience to it. And little did we know, they're now one of the biggest headlining bands in the world. So, yep. I yeah. Love, I yeah. love seeing where they've been able to come from. And the uh, I assume you've watched their documentary. Yeah. Um, Viva the yeah. Underdog. Yeah. 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 And the, the guy that's like essentially running their stage show was like an electrical apprentice. That used yeah. to just follow them around to show. I love that. That's so, yeah. so good. Such a good. That's story. the thing. They and they just haven't changed. They've always just been the the surfers from Byron that just lucked out. You know, they've worked yep. their ass off for it. So I wouldn't say lucked out was the right words to choose, but yeah, luck lucked out in the case that you know that, that's a one in a million. There's there's a million other bands that play a similar style of music that didn't make it, and that's through yep. business decisions that these guys made. Mm, so. Hard work, but also even then to get as big as they have, like you, they could do everything right and still have a dream run and get huge and not be anywhere near as big as they are. Cause they, yeah. they, they, they got mainstream big, but they're extremely heavy. Yep. It's, it's crazy. But that's the thing. And as much as those budgets are in there and this sort of circles back to bring it back to photography, there's no budget left for a photographer. Yes. You know, bands, once they get to that stage will generally have their own photographer to cover that type of stuff. So, yeah. You know, a band blows in, you don't pick up the job. They're touring with somebody. So yeah. it's um, it's a hard thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. And that, because they want someone that, um, that understands them, that gets the lifestyle stuff as well, um, gets different perspectives yeah. from each show because they're kind of putting together an entire story as opposed to just, I've got one night to shoot Parkway Drive. So I'll, yeah. you know, do all this stuff. So they'll, they'll be the ones that are sort of in the back of the venue or up in the, you know. Yeah. Yeah, or up on, behind a speaker stack or something, yeah. getting weird angles and things because they've they've got an entire tour to play with. To or they know what's happening, so like, stuff's choreographed yeah. and they know it's coming. Whereas, you know, I'd say ninety nine percent of the shows that I've ever photographed, you've got no idea. You just go into three songs and you shoot what happens, and you work yeah. with light. And for me, I pay attention to the sequence of the light. Exactly. There's no point chasing a correct exposure when the light sucks and the light's good. 
you sit yep. and watch the sequence in the light, find out where the good light is, expose for that and shoot. But yep. I found there's only two shows that I ever shot where it was a little bit more controlled. And one of them was Slipknot because of Pyro and being oh, yep. told for this song, you have to shoot from here. And it's because, you know, you're not going to get your face blown off by Pyro. Yep. And the other one was U2 because the PR agent would come out. We were all in the, the, conference room before the show and that was on that 360 tour they did with the round stage yep where they walked around through the crowd so we were on a little platform at the side of the outer circle so we're told you know bono will come out this way the edge will come out this way they're going to stop and they're going to rock out in front of each other and then they're both going to turn and look at you then they're going to cross paths when that happens stay on bono because he's going to turn around and go like this into your lens and we knew oh, what yeah. was going to happen so I mean, you can just imagine they want those are the shots that they want to see in, in press. Yeah, I was I was going to say it's interesting. It's like uh, it's a little bit manufactured, but they're going to get the image that they're looking to get a, mm. across most publications by wording you up about what's going to happen. Um, yeah, yeah, it's smart. It's, it's yeah, smart. definitely. Yeah. So look, it's you know the unpredictable nature, the action of it, the you know the volume. The, the music, I mean, that's what I was hooked on. I was just addicted to doing it. And then, you know, wildlife was always the, the thing for me growing up that I was passionate about. But, you know, that's overtaken. The, the amount of work as a career now is overtaken for travel and wildlife um, from music. But there was a long time yeah. where, you know, music was was what was bringing money into the bank outside of obviously working with Nikon and Kodak and yeah. Canon and all of the other brands. But, yeah. Yeah. So I guess also, you know, you've done some pretty amazing things when it comes to, to music photography. So it's like you can kind of sit back and be like, well, I've, you know, I've shot Metallica and, and stuff. So, so you, mm. maybe you've, um, yeah, you've well, I'm probably got a good bow on it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, that's the thing. I can kind of go tick, done it. Like, yeah, if I'm, if I'm honest, there's not a whole lot of music coming out that's exciting me anymore. So yeah. I'm, it kind good of just become work, you know, yeah. you'd still enjoy yeah. it, but. It's far more enjoyable when they're bands you enjoy. But, um, yes. you know, would I jump in and do it again still? If there was a commercial reason to do it, I would. I just I just don't want to be that person that's taking the pass and doing it and fueling the fact that nobody else is getting paid to do it either. So yeah, I'll just, just sign out. I did the glory days and I'll sit and hang my hat up and say that yep. I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. Stick to wildlife. Yeah, definitely. Sounds good. Well, maybe we should leave it there. Sure thing. Wonderful. I'm going to, I'll close this one off. Thanks everyone that's still watching. Uh, Thanks everyone. Later on, leave us a comment down below. There'll be uh, links in the description for all of Jay's stuff, his social profiles, uh, the Photography Workshop Co. website, uh, all that kind of stuff. And otherwise, uh, Jay, stay on the line for a second after I end this and we'll uh, see you on the next one. Will do. Cheers, guys. <laughs>